Hello and welcome back to my channel, Deku Fanfic. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off the third part of our series, What If Deku Mastered OFA and His Own Quirk. If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Han Baron from fanfiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. Chapter 24. This will be more some of the details I brought up in the last chapter, namely my new character as well as what Night Eye is being brought up to speed on. Then I'll cover the characters as they return to UA. So on with the show. Huh, well, this is interesting. The guy who had that black whip or whatever power had possibly held OFA for about 10 years or so. Each previous user may have only had the power for about a decade before that FO maniac caught up with them. But how did he know each time? Unless, HM. Well for now I need a second opinion to follow up on this guess. So I call Gran Torino the evening before Night Eye and Izuku are supposed to show up. What do you want? Can't you let an old man sleep in peace Toshinori? Sorry about that, but this is someone else. I'm following up on something Toshi was looking into. I tell the old man with a chuckle. After explaining who I am and my relation to Toshi and Izuku and the fact I know about OFA, he feels more inclined to work with me. So, you want to know about how long my sworn friend had OFAA? I'm guessing you have a suspicion how long it was as is, or you wouldn't have called. And my affirmative in saying I had guessed about ten years, the old man agreed. He went on to explain the two of them were a fairly capable hero team back in the day, explaining that they were nicknamed the high-flying duo and they could get to crimes and defeat villains faster than most at the time. After he's done reminiscing, I mentioned that there is a chance that Izuku could gain her power. Even without seeing his face, I can tell he is dumbstruck. From what Izuku and the previous user he spoke with in his mind said, he'll be unlocking all of the previous user's powers. Since you knew her well, maybe you could fill in a few blanks. I say before explaining that I need details on the one before her. After a bit of hem hawing around, Torino gives me a few details. The guy who had passed it to her was named in and had some sort of smoke power, and entrusted the power to Nana after a desperate fight had left him basically dead. But he still believed in what Nana could do and was hopeful for the future. Well, that could interesting for Izuku to learn. But it'll also be tricky to pass off. That might be one he'll have to figure out himself. Torino chuckles at the mention and asks what I'm doing with Toshi. I'm basically his teacher right now. You know what that is like right? After a bit of a laugh between the two of us, I continue by saying, he needed someone who knew more about this type of power he's awakened. And I'm the only one he trusts for now and I managed to fix him up. Wait, what? The old man shouts over the phone. After jerking away, I mentioned that I had restored his internal organs and gave him back some time that had been dwindling away. I might have broken the old man because it sounds like he's muttering to himself. He finally snaps out of it and thanks me for not just teaching Toshi, but also saving his life. Nana entrusted him to me, and he still ended up badly hurt. If you saved him, you've helped me as well. Thank you. I smile at hearing that. Before I hang up, I suggest to him to keep an eye out in his area for possible true metas, and to teach them if he can. If that old man can make someone like Toshi into a capable hero, he can do that with just about anyone. I'm not sure what All Might and his intern want to talk about but I know this has to happen. I've been avoiding him since he was injured, and I kept pushing him to find a successor. I had truly expected him to chose Mirio. The boy seems almost like a mirror at times to my old friend, and with his quirk he could be an even greater hero than what All Might represented. Though, what Kibu said is an exceptionally good point. Mirio wouldn't have wanted to be a hero just to replace All Might. He would have wanted to become and show the kind of hero he is, on his own merit. Not the kind that I set up for him. Perhaps some of that insight is what All Might saw in the boy, let alone what he did for that poor man from the other day. After hearing what that Jotaro boy had said about quirks hurting people without us seeing it, I guess it shouldn't be surprising that the quirks could be causing more pain as they get stronger. For now though, we have a big discussion to go through here in this place I set up for All Might. I'm amazed and glad he finally used it. I called late one night and was so happy to hear that Jotaro boy answer the phone instead of All Might. He mentioned that he had made sure All Might slept and was following up on something related to OFA as a whole. The power Kibu had used was apparently a previous user's quirk, which is very surprising. But maybe that is where some of this discussion will go. When I open the door to the house, I can see All Might resting on the couch. At least I think it is him. He's not as emaciated as he was the last time I saw him. As he snorts awake and looks toward me before saying with a small smile, Hey Mirai, it's been a long time. This is All Might no doubt. Midoriya doesn't seem surprised. But even though I had explained a few things to Mirio, he also is shocked by seeing the greatest hero in Japan so much smaller. What has happened in the last year? Once the visitors had arrived, a few explanations could begin. So where would you like us to start? Jotaro asks first with a smirk on his face. Nidai decides to start and asks how All Might had somewhat healed from his injuries. Mirio mirrors this thought as Nidai and Izuku had shared some of the secret of OFA with him. While he was floored that such a power exists, the fact that Izuku was awakening more powers, and that there had been someone strong enough to gravely injure All Might, was an even more terrifying thought. All Might speaks to the fact that Jotaro had been the one to heal him. 
He and Safentite fixed me up. The girl used her power as a genie to create some base cells for my stomach, and Jotaro used a special energy wave that accelerated my healing and restored both my lungs and stomach. The fact that the boy who they thought was just strong and powerful had healing abilities amazed them as well, with Mirio realizing that he truly was outclassed in terms of multiple things he could do compared to the freshman. Okay, give me a second. So after he healed you, you are now able to stay in this hybrid form and have some of your time extended. Naide asks before All Might smiles saying not only that but I've unlocked something. With that he stands up and lets his new power flow through him. Jutero goes on to explain that All Might had underlying potential as a true metahuman, describing his new power as a super speed type. We got involved in an incident the other day and he was able to move so fast and save everyone before the villains could even react. Izuku speaks up next as having kinetic absorption, amplification and enhancing powers as his true meta power. But I'll admit it is taking a backseat to what is awakening within OFA. I barely managed to talk to the fifth as well as the first users. All they mentioned was that OFA has reached a singularity, and that my true meta powers seem to be working in concert with the quirk. That might be a good thing Izuku. I'm thinking there may be a bigger problem down the line. Jutero says with a serious face. What do you mean? Is there something that could hurt him? Mirio asks with a concerned look on his face. Jutero shakes his head before going into a lengthy explanation. I've been doing some digging along with All Might, looking into all of the past users. Yes, I can do that even though I'm blind. Moving on, I found something unusual with who I'm guessing is the fourth user. I can't confirm, but it seems like he may have been hiding away from everyone, possibly to figure out how OFA works. Most accounts say he was something like a hermit, only having one contact, the one who would become the fifth. But that's not the strangest part. I found an autopsy report on him. It do. It said he died of old age, at 40 years old. This part shocks and confuses all in the room. All my questions how that is possible since he held the power for 40 years before passing it to Izuku. This is when Jotaro gets a pained look, before admitting he is mostly speculating on his next point. I think it may have to do with quirks. I'm obviously not sure, but it may have something to do with it. There's a couple of things pointing me to this. He told us about the fact that when some people were given quirks by AFO, they became mindless right. With a quick affirmative from All Might, Jutero continued by explaining that some part of a person's mind might be attached to their quirks. Again I have no proof, but something made me think of that after researching and the USJ incident. Remember the Namu. Those things had multiple quirks, they were dead bodies more than likely modified to handle more than one quirk. What if, the person's consciousness remains with their power? It makes no sense, but I might be what is muddling the minds of the creatures, and why they can only follow orders. He said before going on with the idea that the only reason it may have worked for F.O. for so long was that his own will or mental capability destroyed the other minds he brought with him, or he sealed them away. After the lengthy explanation of what could happen with quirks that are stolen, Nidai asks how this relates to Izuku and All Might. Right got sidetracked. Anyway, what if a person who gains OFA on top of their original quirk, has their body start to break down because, well quirks are somewhat detrimental to their health already, adding another one or in this case six powers on top of it could cause their bodies to break apart more than just the recoil. The only reason it worked for these two was because, they just by chance, had bodies that were more malleable and had more potential. And I'm not talking about the true meta powers. The only reason they could unlock the full power of OFA is because they both weren't held back or damaged by an original quirk in the first place. Nidai's eyes widen at the implications of what Jotaro just said. Mirio is the first to speak up with, so if this power was passed to someone like me, or anyone with a quirk, we might have died not long after having it transferred. Jotaro admits that he's just guessing, as his own experience is from dealing with true meta powers, saying that they are fundamentally different compared to quirks. How do you mean? You've never actually explained how you know all of this, and why you are so knowledgeable about these true meta powers. Who are you? Nidai asks. The three quirkless look between each other as if having a conversation in their minds. But All Might gives Jotaro a look as if to say, he should tell them. With a sigh, Jotaro says to hold still before putting his hands on both of their heads. All of a sudden, Mirio and Nidai see visions of Jotaro's world. Who he is, what he's done, and what he represented in his old world. When he's done, Nidai looks up at the teen, eyes full of admiration. Mirio himself comments, well that explains so much. No wonder I wasn't a challenge. If anything though, I'm glad you are here. The last statement given with a smile, before offering his hand for Jutero to shake. Which he does happily. After all the exposition is done, the two get brought up to speed on a few matters. Including a plan All Might and Jutero had put together for when OFA fully leaves All Might's body. Nidai agrees with the thought process, but finds it unsettling on what All Might intends to do after OFA is gone. But All Might was firm and said, it has to be done old friend. I can leave as the symbol of peace, but with what I can do now I can still save so many people. Night I decides before asking him to take a bit more time to rest though. With that done, all involved stay for a dinner Jotaro had set to slow bake before they arrived. 
In the town, though, Mirko is visiting with Gomtai about what he used to do in the arenas. I focused on throwing people off on how far I could punch or kick. Wore gloves or skin-tight pants that had stripes on them to give off an illusion effect. Made them underestimate my hits. Plus, when you can wrap around multiple limbs with little effort, you can make some people submit pretty easy. He says with a grin while sitting in his cell. Mirko gets a chuckle out of that and decides to ask a few other things about his background. She had done a check herself, finding out he was from an extremely poor family out in the sticks. He didn't have much and couldn't afford to go to a hero school. Instead, he fell into underground fighting and found he had some skills and talent for it. He used that money to try and help his siblings. At least that was what she had found calling in a few favors. She wanted to hear from him what he was fighting for. When he explained that he had just been fighting to help some family and that he was more worried about them than what was going to happen to him, Mirko smiled. That was exactly what I wanted to hear. Listen, I have some pull with the commission. Now you agree to some conditions, I might be able to swing you getting released to my agency. Gomtai is confused by her offer and asks why she is making it. She goes on to explain that he has good skills for a fight, and he's not interested in hurting those who don't deserve it. You might not be able to be a hero, but I think you could do a lot of good as an instructor. Just give it some thought. I'm here for another day. See you later. As she leaves, Gomtai goes over the offer in his head again and again. He's just amazed that any hero would give him a chance. He's already been branded with the stigma of a villain due to his underground fighting past but she's still willing to help him. It might be worth taking. I doubt I'd get an offer like this from anyone else, and maybe I can still help back at home, if mom hasn't wasted all the money on booze again. When Mirko visits again, she can tell what Gomtai is going to say. If you're willing to believe in me, I'm willing to give it a try. He says with a small smile. She nods with a big grin on her face before calling to the commissioner. While said woman isn't too sure about a villain being allowed to work at a hero agency, when Mirko brings up the fact that some heroes had taken undue credit, she relents with a grumpy sigh. Her job done, Gomtai is eventually transferred to a precinct near Mirko's agency, and he get released to her custody as a parole for his sentence. No POV. On the last day of the Night Eye Agency group's visit as well as the last day of internships, Mirio and Izuku thought it would be a good idea to spar with both Jotaro and Toshinori. I want to see what you've learned from Jotaro, All Might. And I've got some new techniques to show both of you. Izuku was the first to say, and Mirio was quick to chime in with, I've only seen a little of what Jotaro is capable of. Kibu is impressive on his own, but you two are great heroes as is. The two who had been training in secret saw this as a good opportunity. For Toshinori, he could get a better feel for how to use his meta speed with most people. So far, he'd only tried to use it against villains. Or rather thugs. It is just like John has said. Most of the people we all call villains are little more than thugs or animals who want to use their quirks however they want. They don't stack up to true villains like AFO, Shigaraki, or that Dabai maniac. He thought to himself. For Jotaro though, he saw this as a chance to see how Izuku had grown since he'd gotten a feeling for what his maximum could be. So both agreed and Jotaro was the first to step up against Izuku. They both agreed to keep it simple for the most part. Jotaro had shown Izuku how to replicate the power of float or flight with his kinetic powers, but the greenette still needed time to refine it, let alone learning how to use the float quirk alone. Let us all agree that you will stop the matches after a set time. I'd say about five minutes. Might I called while the two were warming up in the large field behind the hideaway. With a quick nod, both boys got into position before rushing each other. Jotaro opened up with a kick, but Izuku was quick to jump over it and deliver a kick of his own to the larger boy's face. This sent Jotaro back a bit but he was quick to recover and respond with a slam to the ground. The slam didn't hit Izuku, but it did send dirt flying everywhere. And before he could react, Jotaro was on him with a strong right hook before following up with a couple of rapid punches. But Izuku surprised him again by firing off six to wear Air Force smashes, right into Jotaro's chest. This sent him back again, and Izuku wrapped him up in black whips. He proceeded to spin around a few times while calling out, Wichitar line smash, before slamming Jotaro into the ground. When Jotaro got up he coughed before saying, Wichitar line ha. Yes you overheard me singing that a few times. When he stands, he unleashes a shockwave of his own, sending Izuku backwards. Jotaro then takes advantage of the metal soles on Izuku's boots, by using electromagnetism to pull the smaller hero toward himself. He spins around and unleashes a strong straight to his face. This almost knocks Izuku out but he powers through and uses another new attack. By wrapping Jotaro in a rock with separate black whips, he slams the two together, calling out, Atchison to Santa Fe smash. This throws Jotaro off again, and he reels back after the hit. Izuku then makes a light rhythm in his head before following up with a Manchester smash, followed by a double chop hit called West Virginia smash. This pair of chops to his shoulders causes Jotaro to flinch, and the ground around the two to crack. But that isn't enough to stop the larger boy, whose eyes quickly flash and he close lines Izuku. He spins a bit before slamming him into the ground. Once Izuku has bounced up a bit, Jotaro unleashes a flurry of blows, and with one final punch, he sends Izuku flying. Or he would have flown further, but Izuku had just started floating without a prompt. Okay, guess you just awakened the seventh's power. 
Huh, well at least we prepared a bit with passing it off as a true meta power. Jutero says, to Tashinori though, seeing Izuku floating up like that reminds him of his old master. Nirio and Nidai though are impressed that Izuku seems to be adapting to the new power quickly. Nidai then calls the exercise, and Tashinori steps up with Mirio. The later is extra excited to be training with the number one hero. But Tashinori points out, I'm not fighting as All Might here. I haven't picked a hero name yet, but for right now, I'm just Tashinori. With a small smile, Tashinori lets his meta power flow and all who can see get a good look at his white light form. Mirio is in awe for a moment but regains his composure and dives into the ground. Toshi has a guess to where he will come from and is ready for the boy. Right when Mirio pops out of the ground, Toshi is behind him and lands a solid kick to the boy's side. Mirio manages to phase through a tree he was flying toward but isn't quick enough to phase through a super speed punch from Toshi. As the younger man is rolling back, he quickly slips into the ground. He then pops out under Toshi, but the older hero sees the attack in slow motion. While he isn't quite capable of avoiding the hit entirely, he can adjust to where the hit will do far less. As he slides back Mirio is catching his breath. I expected him to be tough thanks to his experience, but he seems to know just what I'm going to do. Yes that experience counts for much more than I anticipated. Mirio thinks to himself while attempting to dodge and face through as many high speed hits as he can. But he can't keep holding his breath, and when he lets it out, Toshi is on him in a second. Which is enough time to copy his Michigan smash and barrage Mirio with hits from all sides with one final punch to the face for a good knockout measure. It doesn't actually knock Mirio out, but it is enough for him to concede the match. No way I can keep up with you. Doubt anyone can. Well, Jutero can, but not as he is right now. He has the potential to match me in speed in this form, let alone outclassing me in terms of strength in my All Might form. This makes the younger hero's jaw drop, and Night Eye is so wide-eyed that his eyes are all but popping out of his head. They both look to Jutero, who just shrugs, saying, I'm saving that trick for something special. You'll see it soon. With a sigh, all decide to leave it at that. The Night Eye group headed back to the agency the after that, and the other two decided to spend the day patrolling and observing around the sleepy town. And across the rest of Japan various other hero students were improving and somewhat enjoying their last days with their mentors. With the exception of Safentite's group, they all weren't too keen on being models for a commercial. With the training done, Jotaro and Tashinori head back to UA. Once back they all start discussing their internships and what they had learned during their time. Ida had learned a few new tricks to help him get around at higher speeds from his brother. I'm not quite ready for the family special enhancement, but I should be soon. Momo was feeling a bit more confident, but she was still doubting herself after working as Yuabami's assistant. Safentite was quite annoyed by the whole matter. Maita was slightly traumatized for some reason. A few people though were quick to comment on the incidents that Izuku and Jotaro had gotten caught up in. You really lived up to the name and title you chose for yourself. So manly, Hiroshima was quick to say while patting Izuku on the back. Takoyami was quick to make a different point. Jutero who was that person that helped you defeat those villains. He's a new true meta. He's a bit older, but still pretty capable once I helped him figure out how to use his power. A few of his classmates ooed at the mention of him training a true meta. With Ida commenting, while that is a bit of a deviation from what the internships intend I can see the merit in it. You two were even faster than Mirko. At hearing that he got to see the top female hero up close and personal, Kaminari was quick to ask a few questions. And Jutero was quick to cut him off with a chop to the head. Sato then brings up a perspective that most of them hadn't thought about. You mentioned that most true metas awaken at random and by accident once. So, what happened to you? How did you get your powers? A large-lipped student asks while scratching his head. Jutero's eyes widen behind his glasses, and a few take this as a memory or something that he doesn't want to talk about. But with a sigh Jutero explains some of his backstory. I was on a sailing trip with family in California. I had family out there. There was a storm. And I got washed away and they never found the rest of my family. Sato is quick to try and apologize and some of the others look at Jutero in sympathy. He then continues by saying that wasn't when my powers awakened. I washed up on a deserted island and I was stuck there for a few months. Then another storm brewed and I ended up getting struck by lightning. It activated my powers all of a sudden, and I could hear so much it was driving my crazy. Then all the energy in myself activated somehow and I caused an explosion that destroyed the whole island. At that mention the other students are terrified of Jutero's power potential again, as well as feeling like he has lost too much in his life. Safentite and Achako are the first to go up and give him a hug. Safentite takes over by saying, Our families were friends, so he wound up living with me for a while. I think you were ten at the time. It wasn't long after that, I accidentally angered some powerful spirits from my father's homeland. And they cursed me to becoming a djinn. And he freed me from that. Momo and a few of the other girls nod thinking that explains the two's closeness. With the explanation done Sato stands up and bows apologizing to Jutero. Aizawa then decides to come in and tell the students what then next few weeks will entail. Though he is also planning to have Jutero meet with Hound Dog to deal with some of his issues. But while the heroes were getting ready for the next assignments and training, the villains were starting to make moves of their own. 
In a shady bar, Kirajiri and Tamura were talking with the master and the doctor. I've at least somewhat recovered sensei. I still can't believe the guy who did this to me didn't have a quirk, but a different power altogether, let alone those other two. Tamura says while wincing a bit. He feels up the false limb gently, careful not to touch it with all five fingers. He can still feel the ripping of the appendage off, and it makes him want to rage a bit more. He starts to mutter about the government weapons called heroes, but Kirajiri stops him for a moment. It didn't seem as though it was intentional. The boy in question seemed terrified of himself and what he did after he did it. The master then hums a bit before saying, I guess that isn't overly surprising. Not only is he hoping to be a hero, but there might be plenty of people who would be scared of what they can do if they had his power. He and the doctor both mentioned that plenty of people who first awakened quirks were much the same in the earlier days. Then he had lost sanity or sense of what it meant to be human. Though AFO did mention it had happened about 20 or so years before he was born. In many ways, his and the other's powers might be more natural. No one knows how or why quirks started appearing. And now these new powers are appearing. But they all seem random. I agree. And while I can extract quirk factors, I wouldn't even know where to begin with this new metafactor. Tamira stops the two men from going on their own tangent by mentioning that they need to grow their ranks again, and not just with riff-raff crap out of the back alleys. We need real party members. Tank, Caster, the works. The older men agree, and Kurajiri mentions having put out a few feelers. So far though, only three had responded favorably. Toga Hamiko, Mr. Compress, and Magni. Dabai had seemed interested but wasn't giving a straight answer, and with staying out of the picture they couldn't get others for a possible rallying cry. Muscular and Moonfish were in as long as they got interesting people to kill or fight but it still wasn't much. That is when the doctor brings up the possibility of bringing in Gigantomasia. The master decides to call his most loyal bodyguard through his speaker, but it isn't Makia who answers. Sorry the big guy is down right now. I'd say I'll take a message, but I'm not sure if he'll ever be able to answer once we're finished with him. This worries the old villain. If his best bodyguard is already beaten, then one of the best weapons to put him back into power and possibly gain a new body is gone. But he maintains his composure before saying, I would prefer it if you didn't destroy my subordinate. I need him alive. The person on the other side just huzz. He then asks who exactly is calling. Let's just say I had a hand in the recent attack on UA. Oh, interesting. So, you're with the group who is looking to tear down part of this messed up society, eh? Of course you assholes are wanting to do it with quirks. We have our own agenda on that. If he still had eyes, they would be widening at that statement. So, the master quickly says to the man on the other side, you have true meta powers I'm guessing. I wasn't expecting to meet a true meta villain so quickly. But I guess given the current hero and quirk-focused society you would have passed under the radar. Something like that. And I get the feeling that while you want to end the society, it's just so you can have quirks be the ruling power. No thanks. Keep breaking his arms and other bones. Make sure he can't move. The person on the line says. The master is both annoyed and worried for Gigantomasia at what the true meta villain is describing. So, he tries to make a deal. I know you hate quirks and all those who basically worship them. But, if you want to make more of a difference, you might find working with us benefits your cause. The villain on the other side hums a bit in contemplation. And the master sees this as his opportunity to try and get a strong set of allies. He continues with, I have experience, resources, and a few strategies and plans to bring everything crashing down. And you could have a leading role in all of that. My successor could help lead you there. Just then, he hears a sickening snap and a cry out from Machia as well as the humming from the supposed leader. After a minute, and more cries from Gigantomasia, the leader responds. And his response will further shake the quirked world. I'm listening. No POV. After speaking with the new villains, AFO sent Kurajiri to Gigantomasia's mountain to bring them back. When he arrived, Makia was in a terrible state. All of his limbs were broken, one with the bone sticking out. His jaw was broken as well and from the bruising at least five ribs were broken. He couldn't even move or build up the strength with his endurance quirk. This was thanks to two of the villains. One was a short waifish man who seemed to be constantly draining the monster of a man's strength. But the more intimidating man had to be the huge dark-skinned man sitting on top of Makia. He was taller than both Mount Lady and Makia with white hair and an angry look in his eyes. When he saw Kirajiri he called to the rest with a voice that would be fitting of a volcano. Hey, I think I ride to the guy you were talking to as here boss. With that the giant of a man started to shrink down, and the little man stopped draining Makia. The later of whom passed some pants to the former giant and even shrunk down, the giant villain was still of an intimidating height. The next two who appeared were a duo of women. One was of average height, with a conniving smirk on her face and flowing pink hair. She wore a jacket with a black hammer and green sickle on it, and Yankee-like skirt. The one next to her was a woman with shorter height and cropped blue hair, but impressively stacked and built figure. While only about five foot tall, she had impressive and clearly defined muscles, some of which seemed to relate to her power. As when Kirajiri looked to be heading towards Gigantomasia, the shorter woman gripped her fist and a wall of earth rose to impede his path. I don't care if you are worried about that animal. Your boss wants to meet with us, so take us to him. Or else, the pink-haired woman threatened with her team behind her. Kirajiri gulped before agreeing to the request. 
He created the portal back to the bar and the villains were all able to meet face to face. Well, so to speak, Kurajiri reported on the shape that Gigantamasia was in, and the doctor was quick to order the shade villain to bring him to the giant guard. I must say that is impressive. Gigantamasia was my greatest bodyguard back in the day. To have crushed him so easily, you could give me a run for my money, AFO said to the new villains gathered. The leader just snorted before saying, please, if it was that easy, then we would have taken over the country already. You probably had a different group of people to work with and less heroes when you started. AFO is impressed by the young woman's insight and agrees, stating that he had been around not long after Quirks first awakened. While most of her team is shocked, the leader isn't. Where are my manners? I didn't introduce myself. I don't use my true name much anymore, but you can call me all for one. It is the name of my Quirk, and I felt it was fitting for myself. What are your names? The big villain speaks up first saying, Name's Luis Lima. I'm originally from Brazil, but I ended up out here following some work. Been through hell in multiple occasions thanks to how cruel everyone with a quirk is. While intimidating in stature, voice and words, Lewis's face doesn't change the entire time he is talking. Completely stoic and monotone. The short man and woman come forward next and tell that they are twins. The woman introduces herself as Emma Anderson and her brother is Ryan. Both were originally from the States but were abandoned when they were discovered to not have quirks. The leader then introduces herself as Natalie Sasaku. She was half Russian and equally ostracized because of her lack of a true quirk. Tamura then introduces himself and name drops Kirajiri. From what he described, we know three of the four powers that you have, but not your power leader Sen. So what can you do? Tamura asks with his eyes narrowed. Sasaku grins before looking at Kirajiri. She then snaps her fingers, and everyone feels a small tremor in the room. It is just enough that a bottle from the bar falls knocking the misty villain in the head. As he is reeling from the hit to the head, he steps back and trips on the same bottle. He then flips over the bar, crashing into a bar stool. And when he tries to steady his feet, he slips and falls again right into a trash can. I can manipulate luck and probability. To an extent. I can boost my own luck, but it is limited. And for others, well you saw what happened to him my Xenakami. Now then, what is it you think you have to offer? AFO is intrigued and impressed by the woman's power and how she can lead this group. He goes on to say that he had been training Tamura as a successor to his own empire, telling them some of the history he had and what he was hoping to do to regain his empire. I know you don't trust me, and frankly I don't trust you. But I think you could be the allies we need to destroy All Might in this hero-focused society. And I may not get my power or position back, but we could surely be allies for a time. Tamira speaks up next by saying, I just want All Might dead, the heroes beaten, and this garbage society dragged down where it has put the rest of us. And maybe that involves helping ones like you who aren't born with quirks. Hell, mine didn't awaken until I was a bit older, and I know how messed up the world has become thanks to those powers. He goes on to say that he just hate everything, but he can respect people who also hate the same types of things that set him off. Sasaku hums a bit before saying that they need to think about the matter some more. Besides, from what it looks like, you need to do some recruiting. Perhaps we'll talk more when you get some more true members. It seems like you only wanted cannon fodder to slow down All Might and to kill the kids. You need more specific roles for your party, don't you? Mobs can only do so much, she says the final part with a smirk. Tamira's eyes widen, and he smiles as well agreeing with her. He asks Kirajiri to pass Sasaku a burner phone with the bar number in it, and they agree to meet once he had gained true followers. As they all left Tamira had one passing thought go through his mind. Maybe there are some things in this world that I don't need to destroy. Once it passes, he works with Kirajiri to try and recruit some of the other villains who were on the fence about joining them. With some luck they will have a full party raid UA together. While this has been going on, the students at UA had settled back into classes. Most were focusing and preparing for the final exams that were coming up. As it stood, Momo and Safentite were tied and still competing for the top spot in Class 1A. Ida was sitting at the second or third depending on how you looked at it and Izuku was much the same sitting at third or fourth. Jotaro on the other hand surprised a few sitting at the tenth spot in the rankings for the class. I'm good at history, science and stuff like that. But honestly math always kicks my ass and I struggle with certain language parts. Especially kanji. Having to translate them in my mind is always hard. I could help you with classical language Jotaro. The one who offers is none other than Shoto. He and Takoyami come forward to help him with his kanji and other languages. Though they also ask if he could help them with English, given he was fluent in it. He agrees and they all plan to meet up in the library later for a study session. Safentite though has been looking at the whole matter with a mix of happiness and a touch of jealousy. I know I said he needs to let others in but come on. I'm the smartest one here. Although I'll admit it isn't fair to compare with Momo given my history. She then gets approached by Kirishima, Sato and Aoyama. Each of them is hoping she could tutor them in their weakest subjects. Safentite smiles before stretching her arms out and catching both Toru and Achako. These two could use help too. So why not make it a big study session? With a big thumbs up from two, and some weird posing from the third, they all set out to prepare for their final exams. When discussing the practical at lunch, Itsuka comes over to tell the rest something she had heard from an upperclassman. That the final would be against robots and that they could go all out. Jotaro though is looking away and hums before countering her statement. 
I don't think so, at least not this year. I heard Aizawa and Mike discussing it briefly before the sound got cut off. I bet they went into a soundproof room to make sure I can't hear what they are discussing. This gets everyone nervous and questioning more and more about how well they can handle the practical final exam. Hitsuka and Rin then ask if Chutera would spar with them. You have incredible skills in not just your power but martial arts. My power gives me a strong defense and a ranged weapon, but I'll admit my hand-to-hand -hand skills are not that good. Can you teach me? Rin says with his fist in his palm and bowing to Jutero. Said hero student chuckles a bit before agreeing, and then asking if a few others would want to join. Tetsu Tetsu is quick to ask for help, mentioning that, your hammer fist or whatever attacks are so manly dude. If you can teach me similar I could really help with my skills. Shoji also asks for instruction though admits his heteromorphic quirk might make it hard to teach. Not really. Quirks are weirder and more attached to the body compared to like mine so actual martial arts instruction would still do you good. Shitaro says before mentioning that his body shape and build would be fitting for a mix of Huanga and even Pencration if necessary. Kaibara Sen is next to ask for training and Jutero suspects that Crane and Manti's style Kung Fu could be arts to teach him. With just your fingers and your power you could really inflict some devastating strikes. And the sweeping movements of Crane's style mixed with the gyration could work together. You would just have to be careful not to get tangled up in other things. With that set, the six set out to train for the practical exam. Izuku on the other hand asks to train with Mirio and the rest of the big three. Really, why do you want to train with us? Shouldn't you work with your class? Can't Jotaro and Safi-chan teach you more? Nejair questions as Mirio and Tamaki are surprised at the question. Izuku then says he needs their help with matters that Jotaro can't teach him. He showed me the basics of how to channel kinetic energy to my feet or other parts, but I can fly and float a different way. Plus, he doesn't have the power to launch energy whips or anything like that. But you do Amajiki Senpai. I was hoping you could teach me some of how you handle the extensions. Tamaki is surprised but does see what Izuku is getting at. So, he agrees, as does Nejair with teaching Izuku how to better control his flight powers. During this training, All Might decides to go and meet with someone who had been pivotal to the world of heroes. At Tartarus Prison, he meets with the former hero killer. I heard that you wished to speak with me, Hakaguro-san. At seeing the true hero he believed in for so long, Chizom is just in awe. But he reins it in and decides to speak more with All Might. Before I was only looking at heroes from the perspective of quirks alone. And you inspired me with part of that. I saw you as the pillar we needed. The hero that truly defined what it meant to be a hero. I still believe that, but now I see that a big part of the problem is the quirks and powers themselves. I saw some of it when I was a hero student. He goes on to explain that he saw more and more students who just want to use their powers to be famous or just use their quirks however they wanted. And this was what started his disillusionment with heroes in general. All my nods before agreeing that they have lost their way, mentioning that, I sought to save as many people as I could with all my might. But in doing so I gave the people a very, well idealized version of what a hero is and what quirks were capable of. And I lost sight of many things while sitting at the top. At All Might's admission of his faults and failings, Chisholm is more impressed by the greatest hero in the current generation. Just like Jay he had his convictions tested. And while he has stumbled, he still strives to save others. Are a few of the thoughts running through Chisholm's mind. All Might then brings up an idea that Nezu and he were contemplating. A possible parole to UA. You have done far too many evil things, but at the same time you could be an exceptional instructor for some students. You know what the weakness is for many heroes and what could make them falter. You also know quite a bit about conviction and determination. Shizom is shocked by the possible offer and asks why he was given the chance. All Might explains some of the history of the villain stretch and his current release to Mirko as a trainer and pseudo-sidekick, telling him that they are considering doing that for a few others who may feel they have no other option. Shizom thinks the matter over a few times, but declines. For now at least, I still have a debt to pay and my justice to serve out. But maybe soon. I don't have my quirk anymore, but I still can fight exceptionally well, and I know how to take advantage of certain weaknesses. Besides, I was defeated by a vigilante without a quirk as well. Quirks and powers don't define a hero. It is their actions that define them. And I still have to pay for my actions. Chisholm says with a small smile and a thanks for the offer to All Might, who in turn smiles and agrees to meet with Chisholm again. But that isn't the part the teacher and students are worried about now. When All Might returns, he meets with the rest of the teachers for the plan for the final exams. Nezu then brings up that the teachers will be engaging the students in an effort to stop them. We will need to put some limits on ourselves, but this is the best way to test them. Though for you All Might, I have a different plan. Nezu says with a small smile at first and then it grows into a menacing grin, making all of the teachers present shiver in fear. Over time all of the students make bigger and more capable strides from properly learning the basics of a few martial arts to preparing for the written exam ahead. Shoto and Takoyami had even taken some time to learn from Jutero and Safentite on some hand-to-hand -hand skills. My father may have taught me a few things, but using my ice as a blade or a personal shield is one I hadn't considered. I've always just gone for big blasts like my heaven-piercing ice wall. Takoyami though found Safentite's suggestion of evasive martial arts to be quite helpful. Now he could work around and get into a better spot to unleash his shadowy partner. 
with the prep done and each of the students working their hardest to overcome their shortcomings, semester finals went fairly well. All things considered. All right, now we just have to beat some robots and we're all set up for the summer training camp. Nina shouted happily with Kaminari dancing alongside her. Jotaro just snorted while listening to their cheering. A few of the other students were happy and excited for the practical and the chance to show what they could do with their quirks. For some though, they had something of a sense of foreboding. Jutero, Izuku and Safentite were the leading ones. Others like Todoroki and Mina also had a feeling something was off. Guys, I wouldn't be so sure it's that easy. Did you forget what Jutero said the day that the 1B rep told us about the exam? How the teachers went into a soundproof room at lunch. Mina says with a nervous look in his eyes. Todoroki agrees, pointing out that the teachers more than likely want to give them an extreme test. We survived a villain attack after all. True Jutero, Midoriya and Anwar were the main ones fighting, but still. After experiencing that, they probably want to test if we are really determined to do this. The bi-color-haired boy says with his same monotone voice and expression. Ones like Mina and Kaminari are quick to brush the thought off, but some like Kirishima and Takoyami consider some of what they had said. Well, no matter what, we've still got to go to the battlegrounds to find out what we are dealing with. Izuku says with a pensive look on his face. Achako though is quick to pat him on the back and tell him, don't think about it too much Izuku. Just one more test to finish is all. With her bubbly optimism, Izuku gets a small smile to grace his face. The next day when they reach the battlegrounds with their costumes on, Izuku and a few others can feel an even deeper sense of foreboding. Of course, Jotaro's severe face doesn't help matters. You need to take a dump man, Mina says when looking up at Jotaro, who promptly smacks the short pervert over the head. Aizawa is in front of the battlegrounds to address his class. Now then it is time for the end of semester practical. I'm sure a few of you have already gotten some information regarding the test. Yeah. We just need to beat down some robots and we can go to the summer training camp. Mina exclaims with her fist raised high. Kaminari does much the same, but their hopes are dashed when they hear someone else's voice. I'm sorry to say that won't be the case for this semester. From Aizawa's capture scarf, Pop's principal Nezu. The rodent like Chimera then tells the students what they will instead be doing for the finals. With all the recent activity from villains, not to mention all of the true meta awakenings, we felt it necessary to increase the difficulty of the challenges before you students. And as such we're going to be fighting the teachers, aren't we? Jutero says with a sigh. While Nezu's eye twitches at being interrupted and at Jutero guessing what was going to happen, he presses on. You are correct young Esvoboda. I'm guessing you put it together from other data in the lead up to the exam, correct? Jutero nods before explaining that going into a soundproof room was just a way to tip him off. I don't want to be too rude but maybe coming up with a special code would be better. After all anyone with super hearing could put two and two together to guess you were preventing info leaks. Off to his side though, Gyro is looking down and tapping her jacks together. I've got super hearing as well, but I didn't notice that. I can't focus it like he can. Maybe that is more of a perk of his experience. I should ask him later. She thinks to herself, interesting point young Esoboda. That is definitely something more to consider. Thank you. And as he said you will be fighting the teachers today. When Nezu says that the rest of the teachers come out and line up in front of class 1A, he then explains that they will be held back for the most part. Thanks to a support student we will be wearing compacted weights. The task for you students is to either handcuff the teacher you are pitted against or escape in the battlefield before 30 minutes have gone by. There is one exception though. At that, the student's eyebrows raise. With a big booming laugh, all might drops out of the sky. Indeed, young Esfoboda, young Midoriya, you two will face off against me. With that statement, the rest of class want to look to the two powerhouses with worry. And even though his eyes can't be seen, Jotaro was a shocked look on his face. Izuku on the other hand looks ready to pass out right there. What's more, I won't be wearing the weighted bracelets. And young Jotaro you are not allowed to supercharge young Midoriya. All Might says with a severe gleam in his blue eyes. This makes the two students gulp, and the others start praying for them to either rest in peace or to come away with few injuries. One last thing. Unlike the rest of the students, you have a longer time limit. We will give you one hour but you must defeat All Might. Not just restrain him. Nezu says, a few like Mina, Minta, and Archako shout out that, the test isn't fair. With a sigh though, Jotaro brings them back saying, remember the start of the year. How Aizawa said that villain attacks, natural disasters and the like aren't fair either. That's the point. They need to push us. With as strong as Izuku and I am, we need a real challenge. And unless they are willing to bring in a few pro heroes, the impact and challenge won't be the same. Astute observation Esfoboda san it does often seem like you truly understand the weight of the titles and masks we wear. Nezu compliments the tall student. Midnight then comes forward to mention one more point. And where you also have some special conditions. I know this isn't entirely fair, but your magic gives you an even stranger advantage compared to even those two. So we are asking that you only use some offensive magic, as well as you not flying. That way we can properly assess you and your partner. Safentite is slightly annoyed that she was singled out, but she can see what they are getting at especially when she sees her partner is Achako and they will be facing off against 13. For the other matchups, Kirishima and Sato are up against Cementos. Takoyami and Suyu have to face the cloning hero Ectoplasm. 
Hayama and Minda have to take on Midnight. Todoroki and Yeirazu will have their quirks crippled due to Aizawa. The principal has to trap Mina and Kaminari. Kota and Jairo have to contend with the loud voice of present Mike. Toru and Shoji have to dodge around the shots of the marksman hero Snipe. And the support hero power loader has to stop Ida and Ojiro. A few of them are seeing this new challenge as a terrifying threat to their chances, especially Yeirazu and Kota. The former had gained some confidence thanks to working on combat skills with Safentite during their internships, but she still wasn't sure if she could match up to her fellow recommendation student. The later was struggling with the fact that his quirk would be limited due to the opponent he was up against. While they were waiting to begin some of the tests, Izuku helped everyone build up their confidence again, telling all of them, this is some of what we were training and preparing for. Totero and I didn't know for sure what was going to happen, but we wanted each of you who has trained with us to be ready for what could come. While it doesn't fully restore their hopes of passing, it does help some of them with preparing for the battles to come. The first match is with Kirishima and Sato against the cement-controlling hero, Cementos. Kirishima is feeling confident and good as they walk into the battlefield. We've got this. We just need to crash through all of Cementos sensei's walls and capture him. As he says this, he hardens up his arms and smacks them together. Sato though is a bit more contemplative. As the announcement to start the test rings, Kirishima is ready to rush forward. But Sato grabs him. What the hell, man? We just need to blast through, and we've won. Think for a second Kirishima. Why would we be up against the teacher with the most range and versatility out of all the teachers? Sato says pulling Kirishima over to an alleyway. Because we need to show our grit and manliness to bust through the challenge in front of us. Kirishima says with a confident look. Sato just face bombs, before saying, I meant really think about it. Both of our powers have a serious limit. You may be able to harden for long periods of time, but you'll still run out of juice. And my power runs out after the sugar rush I give myself runs its course. And then I can't operate for long periods of time. This is a test we are meant to fail. Kirishima wants to argue with his partner, but he can see his point. So, he questions what they are supposed to do. Sato isn't for sure himself, but he points out that they need to get clear of the cement. We should go for the escape option. For now, at least. If he's got it covered already, you'll have to be the one to break through initially. I'll save both of my new sugar rushes for the end. With a nod the two head towards the exit. HM. Interesting. I was sure that they would come straight for me. Seems they are trying to think things through. Well, I'll still stop them. Cementos says to himself, before placing his hands on the road to take control of the roadways. As the students are running through the mock city, a few cement walls appear in front of them. Like they planned, Kirishima smashes through most of them. But when it seems like the walls are coming closer, Sato pulls out a molasses cookie. No other choice. He eats the cookie and his muscles shift into a leaner but still dense form. He takes the sprinter's pose and explosively bursts forward, grabbing Kirishima and placing him in front of himself. Hey, what are you doing? Heck, OWW. Kirishima shouts as Sato uses his new speed and leaner muscles to crash through the walls with Kirishima as the front to his battering ram state. This continues for a few minutes and it ends at the exit sign. But there are even thicker walls compared to the ones they had been smashing through before. Shaking off the hits Kirishima went through before, he tells Sato to superpower up and fastball special me. When Sato looks at him with confusion, Kirishima explains that he'll fully harden to make sure he can bust through the concrete. But we need the power to put me through it. That's what you need to do. Now launch me, Kirishima says before hardening his body as best he can. Sato nods and pulls out some sugar cubes to give himself his standard sugar rush amplification. He then spins a few times before chucking Kirishima through the walls with as much force as he can muster. Kirishima crashes clean through with a hole big enough for Sato to get by. With that done, the alarm horn rings exclaiming that they passed the final. While both are out of breath, the teacher on the outside compliments them on coming up with a plan to get around the teacher with the biggest advantage against them. After hearing this, both fist bump, before falling onto their backs in happy exhaustion. In the observation room, recovery girl nodded with approval. Well, those boys seem to have improved in more ways than one. I'll take your word for it, ma'am. I can't see it. But I'm guessing they took your lessons to heart, eh, Izuku? Jitaro says with a wry smirk. Izuku though just rubs the back of his neck sheepishly. With a laugh, Jitaro excuses himself to go meditate. Izuku decides to do the same to talk with the previous vestiges of OFA. After the matches with Tsuyu, Takoyami, Aida, Ajiro, Momo and Todoroki, a few people had different opinions. Safentite nodded after the match with Aizawa, saying, she's learned to make traps within traps. My magic may not quite compare with what she can do, but it seems to have inspired her a bit. And she didn't let Todoroki take the full lead, like I thought she might. Momo had gone along with the fire and ice user's suggestion of making objects so they would know when Aizawa was using his quirk. But what she did alongside that was to put flash grenades inside the matryoshka doll she created. Then they could take advantage of Aizawa's reliance on his eyesight. She eventually finished the plan by making a duo of traps, one with a catapult. The other Todoroki had that was quickly launched in case the first missed. Aya had taken his brother's suggestion of removing his mufflers to enhance his speed and was able to put that to great effect in sending Ajiro into the air, before smashing parts of the mech power loader had brought. 
Then Ajiro came down out of the sky and knocked the support teacher out of the match with his tail and putting the handcuffs on him. Takoyami meanwhile had put the evasive martial arts training he had been put through to great effect by narrowly avoiding some of the strike's ectoplasm and his clones had thrown his way. He and his partner were still trapped by the large clone, but he was able to free himself and then dodge more efficiently and buy time for Tsuyu to get a clean shot with her tongue to cuff ectoplasm. While Safentite and Achako are getting ready to face off with 13, Izuku and Jotaro are discussing how to deal with All Might. You can take him, right. I mean you've done the whole causing a windstorm by breathing and earthquakes with your steps a few times. So, you've at least got the same level of strength. Izuku says after meditating and conversing with OFA. Jutero sighs before admitting, even though I can do that, it isn't the same as Toshi's power. I have to rein in my strength to keep others safe. He can turn his power on or off since that's more of how quirks work. If I'm being honest, his max output right now is stronger than I am. In this form, Jutero goes on to explain that he has a few other tricks to work with and that he may have to use them in this fight. If you hadn't healed him, would you two be at the same level? Izuku asks with his hand under his chin. Jutero nods and mentions that the restoration that he and Safentite did not only restored some of his time but made him stronger than before. If I'd known I'd have to fight the guy maybe I wouldn't have fixed him up. Izuku then gives Jutero a sideways glance, and the bigger teen admits okay yeah I'd have fixed him up anyway. The two converse back and forth trying to come up with a plan to knock out the symbol of peace. After they had talked for a while, they came back into the observation room to see how Safentite and Achako were doing. Needless to say, they could use some help. They had tried to sneak up on the space-themed hero but said hero still noticed them and started to try and suck the two students up. Safentite had wrapped herself around a railing to keep from being pulled toward their opponent. Well, this is just great. I keep firing off magic but it's not working. Any thoughts, Archer? Safentite shouts while firing a few spells at 13. But they keep getting sucked up into the black hole. I don't. Wait. They said you couldn't fly right. But did they have anything against you transforming? Achako shouts, and Safentite realizes they didn't specify on that part. With a smile, she tells Achako to remove her gravity, and the genie girl transforms into a rocket with handholds for Achako to grab onto. With it they rocket out of the way. As they are flying, Achako taps things as they are going by to remove more gravity. When she and Safentite feel they have enough floating objects, the genie rockets around to bring all of the debris together above 13. Achako then releases her quirk and drops the debris above 13, who in turn moves to suck up all of the falling objects. Safentite then rockets close to the ground, and while 13 is distracted by the debris she and Achako knock the hero on their backside. While they are still reeling, Achako moves in and brings their opponent's hands behind their back and cuffs the space hero. We, we the idea it. Anwar Chan, we really did it. Achako shouts happily shaking her fists up and down. Safentite shakes her head and brings the gravity girl in for a hug before saying, no need to call me Anwar Acha. Call me Safi. Achako agrees and the girls celebrate their victory. Well even though I can't see what happened I'm guessing it all turned out well. Jutero says with a joking smile. Izuku rolls his eyes before turning to see the match with Ayama and Minta against Midnight. Ayama had fired of a few shot from his laser quirk, but Midnight still got close enough to knock the French boy out. But Mine is surprised most by using a link of his pop-off balls to loop around Ayama and pull him back. He then ran deeper into the range where they were fighting. What most couldn't see was him slapping his partner to wake him up once they got far enough away. Come on you goofy French douche. Wake up. Kwesi passed to you. Ayama says after he starts to come to. Minter rolls his eyes and brings his partner up to speed. He then mentions he has a plan and to be ready to blast himself as fast and hard as he can with his laser. Just as he is finishing explaining, Midnight has shown back up. I must say Mina Kun, you did well in saving your friend. Well you should have known when you started running, it just got me more aroused, the risque heroine says with a sadistic smirk on her face. Mina then lets out a big laugh before agreeing with her. But that was what I was counting on. I knew you couldn't resist coming after us. But that also gets you away from the exit. Mina shouted while tearing part of his cape and some of Ayama's off. Midnight though has a look on her face that is somewhere between impressed that he thought this out and pissed at herself because she fell for it. Mina then rushes out from behind some rocks with his torn cape covering his mouth and nose as an improvised gas counter. It isn't perfect as he is still slightly breathing it in, but it is enough that he can use his new super move, Grape Rush. And he starts throwing his pop-off balls to stick to Midnight, her whip, and the ground. And just as he is starting to feel the effects Ayama blasts out from above the gas with his naval laser to catch his partner, who almost made it to the exit before the gas caught up with him. Wow I didn't think Shorty had that in him, Safentite said as she and Achako were walking in at the end of the match. Jotaro just smirks and admits he is somewhat impressed too. I knew he had some potential, given we were in the same entrance exam group. But this shows he at least has earned a spot here. For the next two matches, there were differing opinions. Kaminari and Mina failed hard against Principal Nezu and most were feeling sorry for both of them. With the three quirkless feeling especially bad, since all the training they specifically did was more about combat and martial arts skills. Remind me to work with Mina on learning how to read how a fight is going. Safentite says to Jotaro who sighs and says, back to the dojo for those two. 
When it came to the fight between the loudest hero and the student team of Kota and Gyro, they were all impressed at Kota's willingness to face what made him afraid, as well as Gyro who came up with a creative solution to the voice quirk user. Recovery Girl though was annoyed. Oh now really, fainting because of a bunch of bugs. He should be ashamed to call himself a pro hero. Most everyone else was just chuckling at the sight and reaction. But now, it was time for the main event. As Jotaro and Izuku were heading out to the battlefield, everyone back at the observation room was wondering if they would be okay. I mean Jotaro beat Endeavor no problem, right? So, he should be fine here. Momo says with a pensive look on her face. Achako then brings up a problem. But he still got hurt when Izuku-kun attacked him during the finals. All Might probably has the same or greater strength to that. Meaning he could actually hurt Jotaro-kun. A few others have their own theories, and Recovery Girl herself is wondering if both of those boys can handle the full force of All Might. So how screwed would you say we are right now? Izuku asks as they are walking to the battlefield. Jotaro laughs a bit before speaking his own mind. Well, that might depend on how hard All Might feels like going at us. I'd like to think he'll hold back a bit since you are his successor, but I doubt it. Besides, he doesn't have to hold back against me the same way. Once they reach the battleground, Nezu speaks to them, and All Might, over the loudspeakers. Now then, this is the final test for the day students. Justice, Tibu, you two have one hour to try and defeat All Might. Not arrest or put the handcuffs on. Defeat, so, do your best. And hopefully you won't have to spend too long in recovery girls infirmary once this is done. Once the announcement is finished, the two give each other a look that shows how confused they both are. Jotaro then straightens up before turning to his left. He could hear All Might saying something to himself. Well now, no need to hold back. At that, even though he can't see it, Jotaro can picture All Might winding up and unleashing a powerful punch in their direction. Get ready. He shouts to Izuku, and they both wind up and unleash their own strong punches into the shockwave that All Might sent in their direction. But it isn't enough, and they get blown back. What the observers see is the devastation from that punch being reflected in the abandoned city that is being used as a battleground. Shattered windows, buildings starting to tilt or crumble, cars thrown every which way, and a huge crack down the middle of the street. While the two hero students are getting up, All Might lands in front of them. His blue eyes gleaming and intimidation factor cranked up to 10. While it is more intimidating for Izuku since he can see the visage in front of him, Jotaro is also nervous at feeling the bloodlust from the number one hero. I hope you are ready heroes, because I am here to give you the hardest test of your lives, the blonde brick wall says cracking his knuckles. Jotaro gulps before quietly asking, Umum, this isn't revenge for smacking you around while we were training, is it? At that All Might rushes forward again, but both boys get out of the way in time. They then kick toward All Might to knock him away and get themselves some breathing room. But All Might catches their legs and slams them down before tossing them away. As they are in the air, Jotaro says to Izuku, Okay, Suo, yeah we're boned. Good to be back and I hope you like what I'm doing for this arc. I needed a good way to mix in my new characters and replace some of the ones I had removed already. And for those who have favorited or are following my story, could you please leave a review? I'd like to know what more people think of my characters and writing. No POV. As Jotaro and Izuku were up in the air, they were both going over the possibilities of how to handle this fight against All Might. But said hero decided to make part of their decision for them. He's coming. Get to the ground. Jotaro shouted before unleashing a punch to rocket himself towards the ground. Izuku followed suit by using his black whips to pull himself. As Jotaro was getting close to the ground he flipped over and called out, follow up. And that he leapt up towards where All Might now was. Just as the number one reached the peak of his leap, Jotaro was up in his face. He quickly punched All Might in the face, before following up with a spinning elbow strike. As All Might was about to punch Jotaro again, the young hero twisted his body around and put his hands on the punching arm. He then flipped around kicking All Might in the back of the head, and right into Izuku who had rushed up not long after Jotaro. The green-haired team proceeded to unleash a few strong kicks to All Might's sides before switching up and going for a punch to the face, followed by two palm strikes to the top hero's legs. To throw the two off, All Might broke out another of his ultimate moves, Oklahoma Smash, and with a powerful spinning swing of his arms, he blows both of the boys back. But not before Izuku sends out two more black whips. The first wraps around Jotaro and keeps him from flying back further. The second wrapped around All Might's arm, but he didn't notice right away. Try one of my own All Might, Atchison into Santa Fe Smash. And with that he brings both larger heroes together. Right as Jotaro is getting close, he winds up a double kick and unleashes it right in All Might's stomach. Well done heroes, but not well done enough. The blonde hero calls out as he caught Jotaro's feet right as he kicked him. All Might still felt an impact, but he was able to better mitigate said impact. Izuku has a feeling what is coming next, so he retracts his black whips as All Might starts to spin around again. Just before he can try to throw Jotaro, the dark-haired hero reaches up and channels electricity into his hands to stop All Might's attack. He does just that, and it buys Jotaro some time to unleash his next strike. He spins his body in a vertical fashion and then drop kick All Might. The big hero blocks most of the hit, but he is sent careening to the ground. As he is landing on his feet, Jotaro signals to Izuku to come towards him. 
Once the smaller boy is there, Jutero holds his feet and fastball specials him towards where All Might is. Manchester smash. Izuku calls out as he heel kicks the top of All Might's head. The hit already made the number one reel a bit, but Izuku doesn't stop there. West Virginia smash. He calls out next and double chops both of All Might's shoulders. Though with a grunt the pro recovers slightly and then punches Izuku away. As the smaller boy is sent flying, Jutero uses his own punch to send him to the ground again. But once again, All Might intercepts him. Let's see how much you can handle. He says with an excited gleam in his blue eyes. That was insane to watch. They fought for like three minutes midair. Minda shouts as the whole of class when we're all watching the match. Most were dumbstruck at seeing the initial attack All Might unleashed. But then seeing Izuku and Jotaro fighting the number one hero in midair was another level of insanity. I don't think I could ever get to that level even with my zero gravity, Hachako says while wide-eyed at the fight. Lomo brings up her own opinions on the match in front of them. We knew that Midoriya and Jotaro were both capable, but they were impressive for a different reason here. They barely needed to speak and they knew what each other would do for all of their attacks, she analyzed after noting how Jotaro wound up for a kick and sending All Might towards Izuku when he arrived. It had thought much the same, before noting a different factor. But even with their stellar teamwork, All Might is still handling both of them impeccably well. I wonder how this will turn out. He questioned as the next stage of the fight began. Most of the rest of the class were still shell-shocked by seeing a massive mid-air brawl, that they missed the point that the battle had moved back to Earth. Takoyami and Todoroki though were questioning and hoping their new friend would be able to handle this. Achako though was praying that Izuku would come out with few injuries. But for Safentite, she was stone-faced at the whole matter. Not because she didn't care, but because she believed in both of the hero teens. Back with the fight, All Might and Jotaro are exchanging blow after blow with each other. After about 50 hits of punches, kicks, elbow strikes and other attacks, All Might unleashes his Detroit smash at the ground and pushes Jotaro back. As he is backing up, All Might takes a sprinter's stance and rushes the young man. He has his arms crossed and then unleashes his Carolina Smash stunning Jotaro again. While this is giving Jotaro a slight kinetic charge, it isn't enough to do him much good. That and it just plain hurts. Just as All Might is about to go in with another strong hit, Jotaro calls out, oh screw this, and then backflip kicks the older hero into the air. But that isn't enough to deter him. All Might turns around and uses his New Hampshire Smash to send himself flying towards Jotaro again. Only now it isn't just Jotaro in the area. Izuku has come closer as well. As Izuku is getting close to Jotaro he feels a tingle in his head and Jotaro, while not actually seeing what is going on, can guess what will happen next. As All Might is rocketing towards them, Jotaro grits his teeth before saying to himself, no other choice. At that, he taps into an energy form inside himself to get away. Right as All Might is about to be on top of them, Jotaro disappears from sight before reappearing next to Izuku. He shouts, we're out of here, and then grabs Izuku's arm, and blinks him away. Whoa 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 whoa, what just happened? Kaminari shouts as he sees Jotaro teleport away. Safentite has a grim look on her face as she says, so he had to use that energy now. All Might really is pushing them, and that a few of the others looked to her before asking what was going on. With a sigh, Safentite explains that what you saw was Jotaro tapping into a very strange and rare form of energy, spatial energy. He can't really use it offensively, but he can use it to get away in a pinch. At hearing that all of the students' eyes are as wide as dinner plates, with Ida realizing something. This is what he meant by keeping some things close to the vest. He wanted to make sure we, or anyone, would know everything of what he can do. He's somewhat thinking three steps ahead of everyone. I wouldn't give him that much credit. He is still impulsive at times. And I think you'll see why soon, Safentite says. At that everyone looks back to the monitors and they see that Izuku and Jotaro are now on top of a building. And Jotaro is puking his guts out. At seeing that, Safentite gives the rest of the students a look as if to say, I told you so. I guess this is a problem with pulling off that trick. Hey Jotaro. Izuku says with a smirk as Jotaro is finishing throwing up. With a grunt and cough, Jotaro says, not funny. But yeah, I can't do too many teleports back to back. At least not as I am. I basically left my stomach back three teleports. After Jotaro had used his spatial energy to move both himself and Izuku the first time, he did it three times more to be safe. Izuku had already thrown up a bit after the first teleport, so he was in a better state. With a ragged breath Jotaro sits back before asking, how long do you figure we have? I bet we've only got about five minutes or less before he's on us again. And as we, well not saw in your case, he doesn't care about collateral damage right now, Izuku says while pulling out a pair of granola bars from his pouches. Jotaro just gives a disgruntled groan as he accepts the bar. While they are eating, they discuss what they can do next. We did a bit of damage, but I think we got hurt a bit more. Or you did, I guess. I'm just drained from trying to stop or deflect a lot of his hits, Jotaro says after a bite. Izuku raises his eyebrows at him. Can you recharge a bit if he hits you? I know I could get a recharge, but I don't want to risk it given I don't have as dense of a body as you do. Jotaro just looks at his partner and explains two parts to why he doesn't like to get hit. First of all, remember my senses are enhanced. 
That includes touch. I can push a lot of it away and ignore a lot of sensations, but a strong enough one will break my focus. Second, I'm not a fucking masochist dude. I don't like taking hits. I prefer to dish them out. Was that last part necessary? Hizuku says with a deadpan look on his face. With an annoyed groan, Jotaro stands up and says, he's on his way. I'll intercept and buy you some time. I'm betting you can come up with a way to get around his insane power. And with that, Jotaro leaps off of the roof the two were resting on. With his face in his hand after Jotaro's statement, Izuku sighs before standing up himself. All might have been listening to the city by focusing OFA on his ears when he heard the two students. With his smile still across his face, he leapt in the direction he heard the two teens' voices. He was not however expecting Jotaro to come out of nowhere and smash his knee into the blonde hero's face. This completely reversed his momentum, but Jotaro didn't stop there. As All Might was starting to fly backwards, Jotaro spun and kicked the side of his head to send him flying once again. Once All Might was heading towards the ground again, Jotaro used his energy venting trick to rocket himself towards the hero teacher. He then grabbed All Might around the waist and full tackled him into the ground, the impact of which sent a shockwave throughout the faux city, and made the students in the observation room think he was going to set off an earthquake. Izuku sighs as he feels the tremors and keeps pacing back and forth trying to come up with a plan to defeat All Might. We don't have the option to run, so we can't succeed that way. Where I'm at now with OFAS maximum is roughly equal to All Might's maximum strength. Jotaro can roughly keep up with All Might at his best, but even that is pushing it. Plus, All Might can break out of Black Whip let alone using it to bring me in close and knock me out. So then what do we do? These thoughts run through Izuku's mind for the next few minutes. While back with All Might and Jotaro, the two are squaring off again. And when they come together to attack, the cameras can't keep up with their attacks. It all just looks like a blur. Back in the observation room, the rest of Class 1A is still stunned. That was manly as hell. Jotaro just intercepted and sent All Might flying before full-on slamming him into the ground. Hiroshima shouts out after Jotaro's initial attack. Mina next to him thinks that Jotaro is completely equal with All Might. Look at him. He's unleashing blows at the same speed as All Might. I never thought I'd say this, but I think Jotaro can beat All Might by himself. As much as I'd like to agree with you, Ashido, I don't think he can, Todoroki says while watching the match unfold. The others look back at him in confusion, but Ida and Momo know what he means. Though it is hard to see, they can all tell that All Might is faster and seems to be hitting harder than Jotaro. The shockwaves from their punches are proof of that. And while Jotaro doesn't show as many signs of being hurt when the two brawlers push each other back, they can tell he is breathing heavier than All Might. You've done well, John. But you shouldn't have left your partner behind. Not only can you not defeat me, but he can't either. As strong as you are, and even as strong as I am, a hero cannot stand alone. All Might says while walking towards Jotaro. The young man then rushes forward and tries to get a few more hits on All Might. He does get in a few, but he is ultimately sent backwards. All Might then decides to keep the young hero in place by standing on his chest, before trying to make a speech again. Sorry to say before you start in again, but that isn't why I rushed in at you. I'm just keeping you busy, Jotaro says with a smirk. At saying that, Izuku rushes in from behind All Might with a Detroit smash of his own, sending the older hero flying. What took you so long? Jotaro says while standing up. I had to put all of the pieces together to try and hopefully stop him. We've got about 10 seconds. Use your electric mind reading trick and see what I have in mind, Izuku says while taking his stance. The bigger teen shakes his head before agreeing and standing beside Izuku. He touches Izuku's head and sees the rough idea the smaller teen had put together. A bit dirty, but we're probably gonna need that, Jotaro thinks to himself. All Might then tries to rocket toward the two young heroes again, but they both intercept him with a pair of strong kicks to his face. This makes the big hero's head snap back and make his body flip and spin uncontrollably. Just as he is hitting the ground Jotaro is on him again. After three hits though, All Might is ready to retaliate. But Jotaro jumps back from his punch and Izuku goes in for a combo of his own. He strikes his predecessor with a few kicks, before using his Air Force smashes to distract All Might, as well as sending him back into Jotaro who proceeds to palm strike the inside of both of All Might's knees, making the top hero buckle. Jotaro then grabs All Might from behind and jumps into the air before suplexing the hero. But he still doesn't let go of All Might after the drop. He just uses his own momentum to pull All Might out of the ground again and slam his face into the pavement again. As All Might is slightly reeling from those impacts, he tries to break out of Jotaro's grasp. But then Izuku's black whips trap them both. After this attack, All Might commends the students. But this still won't be enough to stop me. That's where you are wrong, All Might. We've got you right where we want you, Izuku says with a smile. The older hero then feels millions of amps of electricity run through him. Jotaro is tapping as much electricity as he has stored up and is unleashing it all on All Might. This action makes all of All Might's muscles tense up and he can't muster the strength to break free. Jotaro meanwhile is doing everything he can to make sure All Might can't move. Then with a shout of, I-Z-U-K-U. Now, the green teen pushes himself backwards before slingshooting himself towards All Might's face. He then puts 100% of OFA and his kinetic amplification into his right arm. Alaska smash. He cries out as the hit rings true on All Might. This hit alone almost knocks the older hero out. But what Izuku does next finishes the fight. 
None of them had moved from the spot due to Jotaro planting his feet. As Izuku is coming down toward the ground after the attack, he readies himself for the next strike to hopefully finish this. He put almost everything into his legs and forces himself up, before unleashing a New York City smash right at All Might's crotch. This hit is more than enough to knock the number one hero out. He can't even let out a shout as he is losing consciousness. Once he does, he goes limp in Jotaro's arms. With that done, Jotaro stops the electricity and drops All Might. Once he does, Jotaro is breathing heavily and laying on his back. Izuku, however, is currently using his healing to try and speed up the recovery on his arm and leg. Well, he's out cold, but why haven't they called it yet? Jotaro asks while catching his breath. The problem is most people watching the match are so ridiculously shocked they can't react. Most of the guys are currently holding their groins in pain at seeing that final attack, with some constantly praying to any god that Izuku will never use that attack on them. For the girls, most are shocked as well with their mouths wide and agape. Saffentite though is just laughing, so he goes for the same kind of hit he used against me when cornered. Not a bad plan, but I wonder what this could mean for All Might's future, she says in between laughs. Nezu finally shakes off the surprise and announces, Congratulations both of you. You have successfully defeated the dangerous villain, and you both pass. So the two hero students stay laying on the ground laughing a bit at the fact they not only won, but at the way they won. Ha ha ha, hate you my god. I can't believe that worked, Izuku says while laying on his stomach. Jotaro agrees before sitting up and asking if Izuku had another one of those granola bars. And with that the first year finals are done. No POV. Man all that stuff on I island was nuts. And I can't believe what you all had to fight. Mina says as the group meets up back at UA a few days after returning to Japan. After the incident on I island, the I expo was cancelled, and most visitors and exhibitors had to leave. There had been some repercussions for a few scientists involved in the attack, but there had been some good that had come out of the matter. Melissa Shield had introduced her own special set of armor that even some police could wear. It wouldn't have the capabilities of the suit she and Safentite built, but it would protect and strengthen certain officers on dangerous situations. And while not publicly announcing it, she was planning to become a hero. Not just in the background like what her father had been doing, but one on the front lines. Izuku, Jotaro, and Safentite were glad for what she had accomplished in a short time, and they had made her an offer before they left. I'll be a hero, like my father and like Uncle Might. It may take a while but, Melissa said as the three quirkless heroes were getting ready to leave at the airport. Izuku was the first to come up and say how awesome it would be. Plus you'd be a truly quirkless hero. Ah not that you can't be a hero without powers. Or that I think. Izuku started but Melissa stopped him. She smiled before saying, I think I know what you mean. Everyone who is a hero now has a power of some kind. Even if you three don't have quirks, you have powers all your own. But I can show that hard work and a little ingenuity. A hero can be made. Not just born. Jotaro nods before saying, be better than us. It'll show everyone how capable you are, as well as how impressive the machines you make are. He's right. I know you and I had some basic ideas while we were building that first suit. But I know you can take what we made beyond the capabilities we put into the original. Safentite says before giving the girl a hug. Izuku's eyes widen a bit, and he pulls something out of his luggage. Here Melissa, these might help with making a few more ideas for your armors, the green-haired hero says. What he hands her are a few of the hero notebooks he's made over the years, including what he's learned from Jotaro and Safentite. Melissa's eyes widen at what Izuku had written in the notebooks, and just as she reads them, the wheels start turning in her head. Her smile keeps growing and all of a sudden she glomps Izuku, before kissing him on the lips. Izuku practically passes out at this, while Jotaro and Safentite's eyebrows raise. Oh this will be prime teasing material when we get back. Jotaro says with a shit-eating grin on his face. After Melissa steps back she thinks a bit more about what she did and apologizes. Izuku shakes the shock off and tells her it was no problem, while both have nuclear blushes on their faces. But really, thank you Kibu. With some of these ideas I can create so many different devices and counter devices. I'll be ready for a fight with a villain the next time you see or hear about me, Melissa says before getting ready to leave. Izuku nods before saying that he'll be a hero that can make everyone smile. The two off to the side of this little exchange pull both into a group hug with Jotaro grabbing the two first and Safentite stretching her arms around for a bigger hug, and with that the UA heroes left I island. Jotaro still has a bit of a shit-eating grin when they had all met up back at school and tells Izuku, you know I'm totally gonna use what happened when we left I island against you right. Come on really, please don't, Izuku says exasperatedly while heading to his seat. When Mina asks what they were talking about, Jotaro is tempted to say it outright, but he doesn't and just talks about how they have the training camp coming up. This makes a few feel down given that Kaminari and Mina had both failed their finals and couldn't go to the camp. Others were just concerned about whether they would have enough for going to the camp and what the training could be like. Izuku though noted that Jotaro seemed to be listening for something and then he sat down. Aizawa-sensei is coming guys. We can talk and catch up later. You heard the class president everyone. Let's sit down and get ready for class. But how did you know Aizawa-sensei was on the way Midoriya? Ida first ordered and then asked. Izuku just pointed to Jotaro before saying, he's got super senses. So when he decided to sit down, I figured that meant Aizawa was on his way. 
Jutero shot Izuku a look that was somewhere between annoyed and impressed, before turning back to the front of the class. As Aizawa entered he looked around and was impressed. You were ready for when I would eventually arrive. Well done. Now then, today we'll be discussing the upcoming training camp. As most of you know, those who failed the practical exam for finals will not be going to the training camp. As Aizawa was saying this, Kaminari and Mina looked down in disappointment, while the rest of the class gives them looks of pity. That was a lie. It was a logical ruse to bring out your full potential, Aizawa says with a smirk on his face. This makes a few of the students fall over while screaming in their heads, he did that again. Jutero was chuckling a bit but even he was surprised by what Aizawa had said. Since no one failed the written test, the teachers figured that we just needed to boost up your practical skills. So you all will be attending the training camp. However, Hishido, Kaminari, you both failed the practical so you will be in special lessons with me in Class 1B's teacher Vlad King after training. The two dunces have won a whale at the fact they have extra training, but they are both still happy that they can go to the training camp. Once the classes were done for the day, the students go over the guides that Aizawa had handed out for the students. There's a lot of things on this list that I know I don't have. Let's go shopping after school, Toru says with a little jump up. The rest of the class agrees, with the exception of Shoto. I'm going to visit my mom this afternoon, so I'll see you later. Hey Shoto hold up a second, Jutero says before pulling something out of his pack. He showed what was inside and handed it to Shoto. With a relaxed smile Jotaro said he could share them with his mom. Shoto's eyes widened but then he smiled before thanking his friend. Once everyone had gone home and changed, they headed for Kiyashi Ward Shopping Mall. While Jotaro and Safentite weren't too worried about what was listed, they still wanted to come along to hang out with everyone. When was the last time we did something like this? Safentite asks with a graphic tee on, a burkini around her neck and jeans that seemed to accentuate her legs. Jotaro just smiles with his black jeans and boots on, a red and white t-shirt, and a brown leather jacket on before saying, far too long. We should try to do this more often. The rest of the class call out to the two of them and they link up to explore the mall. During the walk around Jotaro was at ease with listening to the general sounds of the place. While it was still noise, it was also the noise of life. Not the screams of danger and battle, or the cries of pain and similar, but just the pleasant sound of people enjoying their daily lives. What's up? Momo asked while Jotaro was helping with a few bags. The brick house of Wona shook his head and said, nothing. Just, it's nice and peaceful here. When they head for the next shop though, they tell Jotaro he can wait outside. Okay first of all, I know you're getting underwear. I could tell that just from my radar sense. Second, you don't have to worry the same way with the other guys. I can't see. Remember. Besides I already have an idea of what you girls look like without anything after what we've all been through. Jotaro says with a completely straight face. This makes Kayoka and Momo blush brightly while Safentite is just laughing off to the side. Across the building, Hachako and Izuku are going through a few things to prepare for the training camp. Izuku had gotten some new wrist weights but was also picking up some new shirts. A lot of my old ones don't fit quite right anymore. Izuku says while heading to a shop that sells his favorite shirts. Hachako though notes she needs bug repellent. And I honestly could use a new swimsuit. I don't know if we'll have time for swimming, but it would be nice to have. Izuku blushes before saying he'll go elsewhere. But Achako stops him and asks if he could give his opinion of some of the swimsuits. After a half hour of blushing from both students, Achako picks out a new pink and white two-piece. Izuku got pulled into trying some on as well and got a new pair of black, green, and red trunks. With Achako eyeing up the muscles Izuku hid under his uniform. And with that and all of the other provisions gathered the students of Class 1 are ready for the training camp. While this is happening though, in the bar across town Tamura is meeting up with a few villains that the black market dealer Jurin and Kurajiri had managed to recruit. First was a young man calling himself Dabai, who appeared to have his skin stitched back together roughly. Second was a woman in a man's body named Magni who had a giant magnet strapped across her back. Third was the mass duplicating villain twice. And fourth was the mad teen slasher Toga Himiko. So these are some of the new people for our guild A. Tamura asked while stretching his new limb. Jurin nodded before asking how the prosthetic felt. I heard that the raid on UA had been a failure and that the leader had been injured. Yes, that was true, Dabai said with some contempt in his voice. While Tamira would normally want to lash out, he instead nodded before saying, I underestimated the one that fought alongside All Might. He was the same guy who won the whole sports festival. I paid that price and now we need to hit them again. And this time we'll have some extra help. When Magni asks what he means, Tamira pulls out his burned phone and calls the number on it. When Sasaku answers he fills her in on the details. So what do you say? You up for joining our guild or would you rather an alliance? Um, I'd say, hold on. I'd say I'm interested. But, I have to wonder what could be in it for us. If they think this is just an attack by your league then they'll think it's all about quirked villains. We want to make our own statement. And we have a new girl who can make it clear. Sasaku says. As they were all listening to the call, they could hear more shots and explosions going off. As well as the screams of various people. A few in attendance gulped and were questioning what devils Tamura was making a deal with. That works just fine for me, and I don't think the rest of my new members will complain about some serious true meta firepower. At hearing that all of the other villains were shocked, they had assumed most true metas would be on the hero's side. 
but now they have true meta allies. Well now, this little sister seems interesting. While I know I wanted the freedom to be who I am, it seems like she wants the same. As well as some payback against those like us who may have put her down. Magni says with her hand cradling her cheek. Sasaku laughs before agreeing with the woman. She then asks Tamira for another meetup to discuss the details. The blue-haired villain agrees before noting that they can bring her to the bar if they tell her where she is at. No need. I know where you are all meeting up. I know you teleport most in to keep the location a secret but I still notice some details. As did the others. We know right where you are based, the probability manipulator says with a teasing lilt. AFO speaks up next from the video screen with a laugh of his own. It seems we really can't underestimate true metas. But I will thank you young lady if you are willing to aid us. With that set the plans and a few more villains recruited the League of Villains and the now named Forgotten have a plan to strike at the heart of hero society. A plan to attack UA and its students when they least expect it. No POV. The day after the shopping trip to Kiyoshi Ward, Aizawa warned the students that the location had been changed. With all the strange things happening recently the staff at UA felt it was better to err on the side of caution. As such we will be going to a new destination only we know about. Vlad King says to his class at the same time in the 1B classroom. Both instructors go on to say that the camp would be used to push their limits to their utmost. Though for Jotaro and Izuku it might be more difficult to find their limit. Aizawa says with a roll of his eyes. The rest of his students chuckle before cheering about getting to go on the trip. Though Safentite is quick to remind Kaminari and Mina that they have extra lessons. Which makes the comically cry but they move past it. With that Aizawa dismisses the teens from their first semester at UA. On the first day of the camp, the teens all loaded up into buses. But not without a scathing comment from Monoma. Well, well so sad that some of you from one have failed the finals. And you're supposed to be the Bisuk Guck. Knock it off you idiot. Sorry about that. Itsuka says after chopping the arrogant blonde into unconsciousness. A few tell her it was no big deal and they load up for what they think could be a fun hero-based summer camp. On the way, Jutero has a quick in mind conversation with Izuku and Safentite. Though everyone else just thinks he is asleep. I think we can all guess what will probably happen not long after we stop right. He first questions to the other two. Safentite gives a subtle nod before thinking. More than likely, they'll throw some insane gauntlet down right at the start and give what would be an impossible challenge for these students. Not like that'll matter too much to us. Also how does this exactly work again? I know it has to do with Jotaro turning his thoughts into electric impulses and then transmitting them. But how can I still hear it? After Izuku finishes his question, his two teen teachers chuckle in their minds. Jotaro then explains that he has his biofrequency memorized. So I can transmit over the ambient energy waves in the air. Don't worry it's secure and not actual telepathy. I don't really like telepaths and telekinetics myself. Ironic considering this could basically be perceived as a form of telepathy. Izuku thinks with a roll of his eyes. This gets a few more laughs from the other two. While the rest are looking at the three like they are either crazy or are having a very weird dream. After an hour of driving, Aizawa announces that they will be stopping for a restroom break. Jutero though notices a few details and smirks. When they all file out the students note that they are at a cliffside. Izuku then sighs before saying, we've been tricked haven't we? Yep and I'm pretty sure the trio that are behind those rocks will be explaining very soon. Jutero says with a smirk. While Aizawa is looking annoyed at what he said, and then two ladies jump out and do a flashy intro for who they are. They're feline fantasies, I'm sure your intro is very entertaining but can we please move on? Safentite asks while looking at the two women in question. This causes them to face fault and the little boy next to them chuckles a bit. Izuku's eyes light up before explaining a bit about who they are. The Pussycats are a four-person team who specialize in mountain rescues. They were founded when we were kids like forever ago. This marks their 12 year suddenly the blonde member runs forward and grabs his face in her cat-like paws. With the claws out, I'm pretty sure your math must be off. Um if you're going to say you're 18 at heart. Then lady I hate to say it, but you are still admitting that you aren't that age in reality. Jutero says with a laugh. He then feels a poke at his head and then he feels the woman grab his face next. She even tightens a bit, but it doesn't even phase the sunglasses wearing teen. You know you can't hurt him, right? Momo asks while looking a bit concerned at the pro's actions. Okay Ruko that's enough. Though I don't understand why I couldn't get him to hear my warning. The brunette who is introduced as Mandalay speaks up next. Jutero grunts before giving an annoyed sigh. He then says, it's because I've got a few barriers and extra electricity running through my brain. I really don't like telepaths. Not as bad as brainwashers but I'm still not a fan. Mandalay nods before introducing her partner Ryuko or Pixie Bob. She then explains that they own the range the teens are looking over. Including the mountain, you two have your bout on. But for now, the summer camp you will be staying at is there at the base of the mountain. She says with a smile on her face. Jutero, Izuku, and Safentite smile a bit because they all note how everyone else is confused by the statement. Achako speaks up first saying, Why are we stopping here if the camp is still so far away? I think we both know the answer to that. Tsuyu says before a few others say that it wasn't possible. And try to get back on the bus. Jutero snorts before saying, Yeah that's not happening. You guys are going to have a long run ahead. Sato then asks, Wait, what do you mean run? 
And what do you mean when you say us guys? Saffentite just starts flying with a laugh, while Izuku shrugs a bit sheepishly, before floating up into the air. And Jotaro just jumps up as high as he can to demonstrate. Well, we didn't expect any of that, but I guess that is just the advantage you true metas have. So to the rest of you, Guad Luuk. Pixie Bob says with a teasing lilt. Mandalay just gives the students the time and hopes that they can make it there by lunch. The rest of you should have guessed. The training camp has already begun. Aizawa says, as Pixie Bob puts her hands on the ground and collapses the side of the mountain, dropping the students into the forest. Saffentite and Izuku are still flying, while Jotaro is alternating energy thrust back and forth between his feet. The teachers look up at the trio and Aizawa asks them to come down and hear them out. Mandalay walks over and notes that the three of them could clear this faster than they could. I gave them that estimate based on what we could do, but you three could reach it in a few minutes. Maybe less. Oh, these two are quite the nice little catches already. Hey, Eraser, can I work with them exclusively? I promise to raise them right. Pixie Bob says while eyeing up both of the boys. Izuku shivers while Jotaro just has a flat look on his face. Saffentite though has an angry tick mark on her head at hearing that. Aizawa shakes his head before bringing up his point to the three. I know this is an easy pass and win for you, but you know well enough that heroes have to stand together. Even someone as overpowered as you can't do everything alone. Look at All Might. He's crazy strong but he still works with others. You're right sir. To be honest I kind of want to go down and save those guys right now. Izuku says while twitching a bit. You can't hold their hands though Izuku. They are heroes as well. And that means they can stand and fight with us. We don't have to protect them. Saffentite says while giving Izuku a stern look. The teachers all nod and agree with what the genie had said. Jotaro smiles a bit before saying, we should still probably go down and help them. Koda sounds like he's freaking out more than he should. The other two smile, and they all head toward their classmates to back them up. In the forest, each of the members of Class 1 are fighting off the earth monsters Pixie Bob had summoned. When four are about to attack the group from behind, they all hear some telltale signs that they have more help. Detroit Smash. Yakao. Aura. Two of the four are blasted with magic, one freezing and one liquefying, and the boys punch through the other two. Really? You did that again? Saffentite says with a deadpan look to Jotaro, who just smirks before thunderclapping and blowing another monster away. Izuku looks over the battlefield and quickly to where Air Force smashes some of the monsters, before using a new attack. With a spin kick he fires off a Las Vegas smash, and breaks another monster. That's a new one. Hachako comments after lifting up and dropping a pair of earth monsters on top of each other. Izuku chuckles before calling out to Ida and Momo. Ida, you and Todoroki with me and Jotaro. We'll bust open a path through these monsters. Saffentite and Yeirazu, you cover the rear with Gyro and Minta. The rest engage only when necessary. We've got a camp to reach. With that the students coordinate and fight through the monsters to get to their goal. It takes the teens about four hours to reach their destination. And quite a few of them are exhausted. Minta's scalp is bleeding and he still has wet pants from earlier in the day. Ida's engines are overheated and being cooled by Todoroki's ice who he himself is slightly frostbitten due to focusing on his ice given they were in a forest. Yeirazu and Sato are both exhausted and hungry from using their quirks, and most of the rest are a bit dead on their feet by the time they reach the campsite. The only ones who are in decent shape are Jotaro and Saffentite. Izuku is currently nursing a broken finger and hand from having to go all out to break through a pair of granite-reinforced golems, but he was cycling his kinetic healing to recover from the injury. Mandalay and Pixie Bob were really impressed with the students. I assumed you would get here a lot later. Guess you guys have a lot more potential than I thought, the blonde heroine says with a smile on her face. Hey, you said we should make it here by lunch. Mina calls out while nursing some acid burns on her palms. Mandalay titters a bit before saying, well I was saying that in regards to how long it would take us. But the fact you got here before dinner is still impressive. This makes a few of them fall before Kirishima comments. I hate to say it but if it wasn't for Jotaro and Saffentite it probably would have taken us longer. Izuku might have brought pulled us up by at least an hour or two but all three of them made a real difference. Ida and Todoroki agree with the red-headed hardhead and a few of the others in the class fall back in exhaustion. Alright then, for the next week you will all be living and training here to bring your quirks to their maximum. Aizawa says before turning over the reins to Mandalay. Pixie Bob though interjects by taking a keen interest in both Izuku and Jotaro. You two and the blue girl seem to really know what it means to fight villains. Not only that but you've got some extra potential, and I would be more than happy to bring it out. In a few ways at hearing that and the slightly seductive look the older hero is giving them, Izuku quickly blushes brightly and stammers a rejection. Jotaro though just gives her a flat look before saying, I think we need to toss this one in a river or onto the top of a mountain. She's way too thirsty and way too heated for trying to teach students. Mandalay snorts a bit before noting that she has been getting worse lately. Izuku then notes the little boy that has been with them from the start. So, is that boy one you two son? He asks while a few of his classmates are trying to stand. Mandalay has a pained look on her face before saying, He's my nephew Kata. He is staying with us for now. Izuku then walks over to introduce himself to the boy. Jotaro though can guess what might happen next and just observes with a smirk. Right as Izuku finishes introducing himself, Kata proceeds to punch the teen in the crotch. Saw that coming. 
Jutera quips with a snort. Ida quickly runs over to check on his friend before berating Kauta for his violent action. I don't want to hang around you wannabe heroes. Kauta says with an angry look etched across his face. Wannabe, how old are you kid? Ida asks while shocked at the child's words. While Jotaro is smiling a bit, it changes when Safentite comes over to him. I get the feeling there is something more to his anger. It's different from just being antisocial. It probably has to do with the fact he is with his aunt instead of his parents. Yeah, I thought that too. Best guess is either his quirk could be dangerous to others and he hurt his parents, or that his parents are missing and or dead. Jotaro says the last part a bit bluntly, but the genie agrees. He then turns to her before saying, you want to help him and maybe get him to open up a bit, right? Yeah, he's just a kid. He shouldn't be this angry at everything. Safentite says with a sad look on her face. Jotaro just gives her a small smile before telling her he hopes she gets the chance. With the students a bit early for dinner but late for lunch, the pussycats decide to make a light snack to at least help the kids recover their stamina. But not before calling to one other person. You can come out now, Mandalay says with a calm compassionate tone. From the tree line comes a teen about the same age as the rest of the UA students. He is wearing a sweatshirt with the hood up and some pants that seem pretty old. All of the students are confused by the new arrival, so they ask their camp teachers who the boy is. We only slightly knew about him and a few others here in these mountains. He is. Well, he's one of many quirkless people who have basically been abandoned or pushed out by others. Mandalay says with a downcast look, at hearing that all of the teens from UA look at the young man in shock and pity. With Takoyami coming forward to say, this all the more proof of the black heart of the society we live in now. To throw someone away because they weren't born with a quirk. How dark could those hearts be? A few of the others agree with Momo and Ida hoping what they suggested to their families could help others like this young man. Though Kaminari questions, I know what happened to him and others is sad, but why is he here? Because he's a true meta, and they want me to train him a bit. Chitero says while focusing his senses on the nervous boy. Pixie Bob agrees before saying, like Shino said we knew about a few of them, but we didn't realize how many there were, let alone that they were still being attacked. About a week ago we got a report of a fire breaking out in an area near here. Turns out some people with quirks knew about them and wanted to use their abilities on some they saw as beneath them. I think they were from Deka City. She went on to say that the boy had managed to activate some kind of power after being attacked by one of the villains, managing to knock out at least four of them before he ran out of energy. Fortunately, we were close enough and we stepped in and defeated the rest. We had a little issue trying to save some of the people trapped, but when the boy here woke up, he was able to save a lot that we couldn't get to. Mandalay finished. Once she had Ida came over by the young man and bowed before apologizing profusely, saying that far too many like them had been too cruel. But yet this young boy still had compassion and a heroic will in the end. Jotaro though starts thinking about the place to go nuts on later down the road, before asking what the kid could do. I, I don't really know. Even when I was fighting, I couldn't tell how I was activating it. Meaning you only know how to use your power when in a fight or flight scenario. Well then, Jotaro says before rushing at the boy and throwing a punch at his face. The boy of course flinches, and Jotaro passes right through him. Thought so, and I know what you're doing. You can produce, manipulate, and turn into M-waves. That's why I pass through, and you could probably pass through to save others. Right. The boy nods and the rest of the class is amazed at what this inexperienced superhuman could do by himself. With Izuku suddenly going into a mumble spree considering all of what the kid could do. Jotaro then apologizes for attacking him like that and agrees to help him learn more about what he could do with his powers. So what's your name kid? Tezuhiko. Ashino Kahiko, said boy answers with his head still covered. Jotaro walks up to him and puts a hand on his shoulder before giving him a compassionate smile. Izuku comes up to the boy and offers to help him train as well. While the rest of Class 1 are confused by this strange turn of events, they are also glad to see the two helping someone else to learn how to use their abilities. Mandalay and Pixie Bob also are glad to see some good come to someone who has been hurt too much already. We have to do right by not just Kazuhiko, but the rest of those people who had tried to make a life out where they have been abandoned. Not just because it is what a hero should do, but because it is the right thing to do. Mandalay thinks to herself before telling the kids to relax for the afternoon until dinner. Just FYI tonight will be the only time we're cooking for you. After that you will have to cook for yourselves. Pixie Bob says while the one teens are celebrating. They all give her an affirmative before spending a bit of time unpacking and getting situated for the next week of training. No POV. With the end of the battle for their lives as they saw it, the teens from UA could breathe a sigh of relief. Especially since class 1 arrived first. For 1B though they had a longer fight ahead and didn't arrive until almost 6 o'clock. Bit of trouble on the way here Itsuka. Jotaro joked while class 1B was dragging themselves into the campsite. Itsuka was panting a bit and nursing extra sore hands, but she mustered up enough energy to say, screw you. Pan I bet this was just a walk in the park for you. Pan wasn't it? Well we are in a nature preserve, so I guess it was kind of a walk in the park. Jotaro says with a puzzled then teasing look on his face. Meanwhile the rest of class 1B collapse one after the other. Even Monoma can't get out a snide remark to the brick house of 1A. The smell of food though, does get the teens a bit more energized. Or at least they are willing to push through the pain to get to food. 
With a chuckle, though, Jutero and a few others from want to help their classmates get to the dining hall. Man, the stuff during the afternoon was good, but it's even better now. Kaminari and Kirishima shout as they stuff their faces with food. Though Pixie Bob is confused on why they are so happy with what they made. But don't forget this will be the only time we'll be cooking for you. Hey Kazuhiko, are you doing? Okay. Yeah, I'm alright. But I do agree this is some of the best food I've had in quite a while, the young True Meta says while eating through his third plate of food. Pixie looks down a bit before saying they were planning to share a bit of what was made with the others from his group of abandoned people. Rin who was sitting with Itsuka and Jutero asks about Kazuhiko. He's a true meta. Aside from wanting me to train and help him improve his abilities, the Pussycats are trying to help him and a few others who were left out here. Jutero says while looking down in anger. He then explains how Kazuhiko had gained his powers and what had happened to their little hidden village. And hearing all of that, the few members of 1B that were nearby were disgusted by the actions of the people from Deka City, as well as feeling guilt over the reason those people were abandoned. I'm starting to see more of why you try to stand out as much as you can, even if you don't intend it. You want to show everyone the potential that everyone has pushed down or away, and to show them that quirks may not be all they are cracked up to be. Monoma says with an oddly quiet and slightly compassionate voice. He does say he'll just have to still show them up, but he can respect where Izuku and Jutero are fighting from. A few others mention that this is some of what Jutero was talking about with quirkless populations probably being greater than they all thought. I mean if they were being abandoned, then that would mean that they aren't counted in a census or anything. I wonder how many of them have the potential for true meta powers. Can you imagine what might happen if a bunch decide to go and take their anger out on the rest of us? True metas do have a fair amount of power and potential. Is some of what is said between the classes about what could happen in the future. With dinner done, the students head into the hot springs for a bath afterwards. Jutero tries to ignore the stairs directed his way while washing, but he eventually has to say something. Can I help you guys with something? Sorry dude. It's just, well we've seen you with your shirt off before but it's still impressive. How do you get that cut and manly? Hiroshima asks before sitting down to soak in the spring. Jutero just sighs before saying, I've been a true meta for a while. I wasn't very active before so I wasn't super fit. But being stuck on an island for a while forces you to get healthy fast. Then add on what the activation of my powers caused. It seemed to do a lot of strange things. Like make my muscles regenerate faster and constantly work them out without having to do much. A lot of the time I feel like I've gotten gains I didn't deserve. But I can't change it. Hiroshima and Tetsu Tetsu just shake their heads before the later says, I get what you mean. You feel like you didn't earn it right. Like you got the badass body, but you didn't have to work at it. And it's constantly getting stronger and stronger. Compared to all of us who have to build up muscle as well as training our quirks. At hearing all of that a few of the students are surprised at the Iron Hard Head's insight. Monoma tries to brag up his 1B classmate, but Ring quickly quiets him. As Jutero is sitting down in the spring he can sense the intentions of a pair of pervs by the dividing wall. Don't do it you two. Jutero quickly says. Next to the wall is Minda and the leading pervert of class 1B Tsubara Barakosai are looking up to what separates them from the nude girls of their classes. Minda then says, how can you not want to see? Oh never mind sorry dude. But still can you blame all of us for wanting to know what the girls look like with nothing on? Kosai agrees before mentioning that the muscles on a few of the girls are extra hot, and he wanted to see what some of the others had. Jutero just sighs before saying, first I don't need to see to know what some of them look like with nothing on. My super senses, plus my radar sense give me a general idea of what they all look like nude. Second, if you two are aiming to be heroes then you want to ease up on this kind of bullshit. Don't forget what got Captain Celebrity kicked out of the US. Mina grips his fists before looking back up at the wall. Kosai is much the same and does a back and forth a few times. We're going to have to step in aren't we? Izuku says while reclining a bit in the pool. Shitaro just gives a grunting yet before the two say they will go plus ultra to get over the wall. So with a sigh, Izuku and Jutero stand. The former floats up to the top to stop the two, while the latter stands before leaping up to the top of the wall. Right as the two pervs reach the top, not only are the two top fighters of the UA first years there, but so is Koda. Before you try to be a hero, maybe try to be a person first, the little boy says with a disdainful look in his eyes. Chitaro snorts before agreeing with the boy. He then thunderclaps Kosai down to the ground, while Izuku wraps Mina up in Black Whip. Thanks you guys. For more than one thing, Mina shouts from down in the pool. Izuku and Koda both turn to the voices and... While well, they get a good view of all the girls with nothing on, with Mina bouncing a bit while cheering for them, as well as Safentite sitting out of the pool and reclining a bit with no towel. Izuku quickly blushes and almost loses his grip on the tendrils holding Minta, while Kota passes out from the shock. Whoa there kid, you too Izuku, calm down. Wait what do you mean by more than one thing? Jutero says while catching Kota before turning his head toward Mina. She, Itsuka and Pony get bright blushes seeing Jutero standing on top of the wall with nothing on. Every one of his muscles on display. Others like Achako, Tsuyu and Yui are more focused on his first student. With Achako even tracing the lines of scars on his arms and legs. And Yui being a bit curious about what Izuku had between his legs. Safentite though stops the mess by asking the boys to head down. 
Just because you can't see doesn't mean you couldn't be charged with indecency. And you should probably get the kid down from there. Good point. I'll take him to his aunt. Chitero says before turning back and jumping down. Izuku eventually shakes himself out of his embarrassment and takes Minta back down to the pool. He just sets the boy in the water before telling him to behave. I'm gonna go with Chitero and make sure Kota is okay. Not to worry class rep. I will make sure these two do nothing of the sort again. Ida says with a chop of his hands before making Minda and Kosai sit Siza and starts lecturing them. With Chitero, he brought Kota to Mandalay and Pixie Bob. Hizuku wasn't too far behind with his own towel around his waist. I had him go in because your teacher warned of the students might try something. Wasn't expecting to. But I guess we didn't have to worry with you two there. Mandalay says while setting Kota down on a couch. She takes off his hat and gently brushes his hair. Chitero hums for a second before bringing up something that had been bugging him. I'm guessing he's not here because he wants to be. What happened? Mandalay looks up at him before looking down at her nephew again. She sighs before saying, if he'd had a normal upbringing, he may have idolized heroes. But fate has a funny way of working. Kota's parents were both heroes who lost their lives due to a villain attack. They were the water hose duo, and they gave their lives two years ago to protect civilians from the villain. Pixie Bob says while looking at the boy with a sad look. Izuku looks down as he remembers hearing about that, and says they were true heroes. They definitely were. But how do you say that to a kid? To him it might have felt like they put their job in being heroes first, and just abandoned him. Chitero says with a sad grim look on his face. Mandalay and Pixie Bob agree and say that they know he may not like living with them given they are heroes, but he has nowhere else to go. Mandalay says while patting the boy's head again. Izuku looks down thinking about what made a little boy want to see heroes as something to disdain. It's not overly surprising. It's one of the drawbacks of doing this kind of work, especially given how you all have made being a superhero a job. To him it's like they were more focused on their job working, rather than being parents. I think there are a few who are like that on the villain side. Chitero says to Izuku's mind. Izuku thinks it over a bit himself, before thinking about Tamura Shigaraki. You had mentioned that he seemed to just want to make the world suffer. Like he had. Could it be that he was abandoned by heroes too? Izuku thinks while the two are walking back to the baths. Chitero tells him it was close, but different. Mentioning that it seemed to be more about all people. Not just heroes and villains. Izuku then grips his fist a bit before getting changed. You're going to try and help him, aren't you? Chutero asks out loud with a small smile on his face. Izuku looks up at his friend and smiles before saying, I'll try. It's part of what being a hero is about right. Trying to save them or help them even when they are down. Chutero's smile grows a bit before agreeing with the green teen. Before telling him to worry about it to tomorrow. With the villains though, they were planning and preparing to attack said camp. Sasaku, you should probably stay back with me for the time being. I know you are big on tipping the odds, but we should wait till later for that. Tamira says while looking over the map they had of the area where the students were. While Natalie somewhat wants to disagree, she is curious on what his end game was. If we can't guide them from a distance, then that means we can't truly replace Sensei. He fought against heroes for years and gained allies he thought could defeat the best the heroes could throw at him. We have to do much the same. Tamira says while sitting at the bar. Natalie nods before admitting he has a point. I always wanted to take them out myself for a bit of payback. But if we are going to really break things down, then we need to have more plans and people out there to do it. With that set, the teams are made, and the stage set for their eventual battle with the heroes and the hero students. At the camp the next day, the students are given more of a rundown of what they'll be doing by Aizawa. You'll be focusing on bringing out your quirks to their maximum current potential. Most of you have gained emotional and technical improvements on what you can do as heroes. But you've yet to truly push your quirks to their best. I'm guessing Izuku, Safantite, and I are a bit different given what we can do. Chitero says while crossing his arms. Aizawa agrees before mentioning that the two had a different set of maximums to work with. Ones we don't really understand. As far as Midoriya goes, I've noticed he seems to be getting faster and hitting harder than where he was at the start. You on the other hand are more focused on not putting everything out so you don't hurt others. But I'm guessing you have other tricks. Izuku agrees with the teacher's statement before noting that when he started school, he could handle about 15 to 20% of his maximum power. At least where I can feel it at right now. I can handle about 30% or so before I start to hurt myself or break something. Izuku says before looking down at his hand. Aizawa nods before saying, it's at least a start. Besides that, you two have a different goal and set of plans, right? Aizawa then looks to Kazuhiko behind class 1A. The boy shrinks back a bit before waving. Jotaro smiles before saying, yeah, I'll help him get a better feel for his M powers. But Izuku you should focus on other things. Namely, trying to get used to using multiple of my abilities at once, right? Izuku says with a smirk. With a nod from Jotaro and Safantite, Izuku starts thinking of ways to deal with his shortcomings. Aizawa then talks to Safantite and asks more about her abilities and weaknesses. While most of my spells require me to create a magic circle or generate it in hand. Simple blast spells are easy, but the more complicated or wide-reaching the longer it takes to set up. As for weaknesses, well I can't do anything to brass, copper, or bronze. At getting a strange look from Aizawa, Safantite coughs before explaining that it was a genie thing. 
She also mentioned that her body can be caught by those same metals, and she can't shapeshift while bound, so that is my biggest weakness. Does that have something to do with Jenny's being bound and sealed in rings and lamps? Aizawa asks while scratching his head trying to come up with a way to train her. He settles on a plan to have her focused on dodging and maneuvering. The rest of the teens though had to contend with excruciating circumstances to try and bring their quirks to the maximum. But not before Class 1B arrives as well as the whole of the Pussycats. The only man of the group, Tiger steps up and asks the power augmenting students to work with him. I'll be working with all of you to work your muscles to the maximum. Get ready to a battle, Tiger says before taking a stance. Others are given different challenges and ways to break through their limits. Todoroki is sitting in a drum filled with water and must rapidly freeze and heat the water within. Over and over again, Momo and Sato both have to focus on eating more quantities of food and sugar to boost the lipids in their body or to push the limits of the strength boosts. Kaminari has to constantly run a current through a battery, and Ida is constantly running around at his current top speed to push his engines. Achako has to keep removing the gravity of objects until she is strained, while Tsuyu has to hop between the floating rocks. Before lowering herself with her ton, Tetsu Tetsu starts to work with Ren, Ajiro, and Kirishima by striking each other to strengthen their hardness and toughen the scales and tail of the other two. Many of the rest of the students have the similar challenges to push themselves, and they have a disdainful observer from the tree line. Toda looks over the hero students and just sees all of what they are doing as a waste of time. As he starts to walk back to the cabin, he comes upon Jotaro and Kazuhiko training. Okay, I know you have somewhat figured out how to turn intangible, but now we need to figure out other ways you can work with it. For now, let your power flow through you. Don't try to control it. Just let it flow for now. Jotaro says while looking over the boy. Kazuhiko gulps before trying it. He lets his power flow as best he can, and he seems to disappear to Kota. Jotaro though is less impressed. He shakes his head before saying, You're still trying to hard to turn it on and off. It's making you fluctuate too much. Try to calm down. Don't think of it like flipping a switch on or off. Let go of trying to control it. Just feel it. Kazuhiko doesn't know exactly what he means but he tries anyway. For a second, he starts to come better into focus and become one with his M emissions. But he starts to freak out as he thinks he is fading away. He then blasts toward Jotaro without meaning to. The taller boy just casually steps to the side and Kazuhiko blasts through a few trees. Kazuhiko eventually reforms and is shocked by the damage he caused. How did I do that? I'm just channeling radio waves, right? Not exactly. Instead, it's more like you are becoming radio waves or M waves. And you still have your mass while in that in M form. So, you can attack at light speed. This shocks Kazuhiko as he didn't expect he could move that fast or do anything like that. Jotaro then explains that he needs to stop trying to turn it on or off, and instead focus on the moment and keep his power circulating. You might find you are able to do a few more interesting things due to that. For now, you should just get accustomed to doing that. Jotaro says before saying he was going to check on something else. From his hiding spot, Kota just scoffs. But he does also see that Kazuhiko was more focused on trying to control his power since he hadn't had one before, and he'll probably just want to be another hero like the rest. Maybe but being a hero isn't the biggest obstacle for him right now. Kota hears this behind him and turns to see Jotaro standing behind him. Kota is surprised before saying, Are you gonna try and tell me heroes are great and I should be looking up to them? Jotaro just shakes his head while pursing his lips. He then smirks at the boy and says, What you find interesting is up to you. And I don't think I need to change your mind about heroes. They have their own set of issues and not everyone is up for it. And not everyone will find them inspirational. But I wouldn't say they are the main fault for what you have lost. Just something to think about. Kota is surprised by what the tall teen had said, and a bit confused, so he just walks off by saying all the wannabe heroes are idiots. Jotaro though can sense the greater turmoil, and knows he is not going to be the one to break through his shell in pain. It's going to be up to you Izuku Jotaro thinks before focusing back on Kazuhiko. No POV. Now then let's get started on making the curry for dinner. Izuku says while bringing out the pots with Sato, Shoji and Jotaro. A series of rites are called out as the rest start preparing the ingredients. Todoroki and Momo light the fire pits, while Achako and Ida get the water for the curry and the rice. While cooking, a few ask Jotaro for some suggestions on any extra seasonings. Why are you asking him? I know plenty about curry myself, Safentite says with a cute pout on her face. Jotaro snorts a bit before trying to cover it up. The classes notice this and look between the two with confusion. Are we missing something here? Nope, nothing. Jotaro says before going to work with one of the pots. Momo decides to take Safentite up on the offer and the two start working on one of the pots. Jotaro meanwhile is focused intently on his pot, and Izuku is suspicious. Okay what's going on? She was a fine cook-in, in the place we trained, that was using magic to create food items. Didn't you notice how all of the stuff was average? It's a general law when it comes to food made with magic, at least unless the magic is actually directed at the food. Otherwise, Jotaro explains while sweating bullets. Izuku's eyes widen, and he puts a few things together. Especially after Momo walked away and Safentite has surreptitiously summoned a set of spices with her magic, and then dumps a large quantity of them into the pot. 
He jerkily turns back to Jotaro and says, Oh, I get it. The lethal chef trope. Jotaro just nods his head before warning Izuku to only eat from the pot he was cooking from. While cooking though, Jotaro noticed something odd. Though only odd for himself. I can't tell if that burning smell is coming from the wood nearby or something else. And why does everything seem to sound off? He thinks to himself while stirring the pot. He even asked Shoji, and the tentacle hero trainee said there was nothing out of the ordinary. With dinner though, there were many who were raving about Itsuka and Jotaro's curry. It may have been from the same sets, but somehow they taste great, Sato said while stuffing his face. Jotaro just mentioned that he took the meat that was chopped up aside and pushed some specific spices into the grain of the meat. Let's the flavor of the spices permeate through the whole thing, Jotaro explained. Itsuka on the other hand had used some coconut milk she had asked the pussycats for to enhance the curry she made. Momo and a few others though were depressed at the state of the curry they were eating. True to Jotaro's warning to Izuku, when Safentide actually started cooking and seasoning the food took a turn for the worse. While it looked just fine, the spices and flavor mix was all over the place. Some like Minda and Kaminori ended up passing out due to the spiciness. Maybe the ghost peppers were a bit much, Safentite said. While Gyro and a few others ended up tasting nothing but extra amounts of black pepper and garam masala rather than the flavor of the meat or soup. Jotaro and Izuku just sweat dropped at the suffering a quarter of the class was enduring. Izuku then looked around and noticed that Kauta wasn't eating with the rest. He decided to ask Mandalay where the boy was. He's probably at his secret base. He just up that trail over there. There'll be a cave overlooking part of the forest. Mandalay tells Izuku with a slightly pained look on her face. A green-haired teen nods and grabs a plate full of curry from Jotaro's pot and goes to look for the boy. He eventually finds him at the cave Mandalay mentioned. Hey there Kauta, I brought you some curry. Izuku says calmly. What are you doing here? This is my hideout. My place to get away from all you heroes and hero wannabes. Kauta shouts at Izuku before turning his back to him. Izuku just looks down before asking about his parents, the water hose duo. But this just makes Kauta angrier. Heroes, villains, you're all the same. Every one of you just wants to use your quirks so you can play hero. That's what's wrong with everything now. Even you and those other guys. Your powers are from a different thing, but you still just want to play hero. Kauta says with his back still to Izuku. Izuku just sighs before saying to Kauta, You aren't wrong in a lot of ways Kauta. I've seen it for myself. But what many of us hope to do is, well to just help or save people as best we can. With or without a quirk. And I think that is what you parents were trying to do. Kauta stiffens up a bit at the mention of his parents, and then tells Izuku to go away. Izuku just sets down the curry and starts to walk away. The next day, training goes about as usual. With those with quirks trying to bring out the maximum potential, and the true metas trying to make the most of their abilities. Okay Kazuhiko, it's kinda thrown together, but this might just help with that other ability you showed yesterday. Jotaro says to the boy. Kazuhiko nods before holding up his right arm. Around his fist is a device that Safentite and Jotaro had built, using some pieces Momo made with her quirk. It resembles a cannon of some sort and covers most of the boy's hand. Okay, here goes, Kazuhiko says before focusing his M waves into the cannon. The resulting shot does massive damage to some of the trees near the training area, but also has a lot of kickback and damages the device. Safentite hums before saying, maybe we made it too big. It might be better if he had a smaller device to focus into for the time being. Yeah, probably. From what I could tell it seemed like he was trying to make the waves too big and almost explosive. Jutero says while scratching his head. Jutero then says that they will be going back to focusing on hand-to-hand -hand combat. While Safentite has to dodge the attacks of Izuku, Ayama, Bondo, Rin, and Todoroki. Before training is done, Ragdoll mentions that they will be having a special event tonight after training. We'll be having a test of courage. Each class will be challenged to scare one another, as well as facing their fears while going through the woods. Ragdoll exclaims with a goofy look on her face. Jutero hums a bit to the side before taking Safentite aside. In the evening, most of the class is excited for the test of courage. Hold up Ashido. You and Kaminari have your remedial lessons, so you won't be participating. Aizawa says with a flat look. This makes the two dunces face fault and freak out a bit before their teacher drags them off to the classroom with Vlad King teaching them, Monoma and Kazuhiko. Izuku looks around and notices that Kauta and Safentite are nowhere to be found. I think you know where Kauta is, Safi. Well let's just say something's got me on edge and she's going to be keeping an eye out. Jutero says. Izuku nods before trying to think of what to say to Kauta. Jutero just has a small smile and says to Izuku, I think you know that talking won't do anything right. Izuku looks back to the larger teen, and then looks down in resignation. Yeah, just telling him about the good that heroes do will just sound like all of the others who have said the same since his parents were killed. Showing him what a hero can do or provide is about all I can think of. But I don't know how to show that. Jotaro just pats the boy on the shoulder before saying, give it time. Grief and loss can make it hard for people to see anything, especially if you are a child. Izuku tightens his fist before going to check on Kata. Jotaro then checks in with Safentite through his mind. Anything going on? I'm not seeing anything. But I have felt something odd since I came into the forest to keep an eye on Ragdoll. It's like I'm being watched. Safentite thinks while looking around the clearing where Ragdoll is waiting. 
After about 15 minutes, Jotaro finally notices some of what had been bothering him. I smell smoke, and I think something else. Jotaro reports to the others stationed nearby. A few look out over the forest and can see some of the smoke as well as the flames. There's some kind of gas out there. Mina shouts while freaking out a bit. The rest are concerned about what could be happening, while Jotaro is worried about a different matter. Why didn't I notice it right away? He thinks to himself before focusing intently on his senses. While somewhat muddled, he can make out a few things that shouldn't be there, including the fact that Safentite is engaging an enemy with Ragdoll, while Mandalay, Pixie Bob and Tiger are fighting a series of villains themselves. He then notices another presence, but it isn't in the direction of the rest of the attackers. At Kauda's secret base he hears his aunt in his mind. Kauda, you have to get back to the lodge. I'm sorry but we can't help you right now. The boy hears in his head. He then hears another person walking toward him. A very large, masked person. The boy starts to run away, but the person jumps in front of the boy before removing his mask. It is then that Kauda is faced with a visage he had seen on the news before. The one who took his parents from him. The villain, muscular. You're not one of the targets on the list. But sorry kid, can't let you go warning the rest about us. Muscular says before bulking up his arm and trying to crush Kauda. The boy cries for help, and it is answered right away by a flash of green lightning. Izuku heard the boy's cry, and quickly activated full cowling at 20%. He then gives the large villain a strong kick to the head and sends him flying. Don't worry Kauda, it'll be alright, I'm here now, Izuku says while facing down the villain. Muscular shakes his head before giving a big laugh. Now that's what I'm talking about. Oh, this will be a great fight kid, I'm going to have to get my special eye out for this fight. The buff villain says while taking a few faux eyes out of his pocket. Kauda tears up a bit before saying, he's the one. The one who, took your parents from you right. Well he's not taking you, Izuku says with a determined look on his face. He full cowls up again and strikes at the villain from multiple angles. But Muscular can somewhat keep up. Not bad. You've got some decent strength, but it's nowhere near enough. He shouts before catching Izuku's leg and slamming the boy into the ground. He then punches down onto the boy, but Izuku blocks with his arms at the last second, getting a small kinetic boost that repairs any damage that Muscular might have caused. He does this a few more times before Kauda throws a rock at the man. You just enjoy tormenting people, like you did my parents. Kauda shouts with tears in his eyes. The man looks back at the boy before realizing he was the son of the two who took his eye. I think you've got the wrong idea kid. I just wanted to kill and rampage. I don't even blame them for taking my eye. But it was sad that they thought they could stop me with as pitiful of a power as they had. Muscular says before bulking up his arm and preparing to kill Kata. But Izuku gets up again and strikes as many points as he can in quick succession. I'm just a bit faster, but with his muscle fibers he can tank most of my hits at the level I'm at right now. I'll have to go a bit for broke. Izuku thinks before building his plan. He dodges around and waits for an opening before kicking some dirt into the remaining eye of the villain. While he is reeling, Izuku quickly wraps Black Whip around the villain, holding him in place while pushing himself backwards. He then slingshots towards the villains and puts everything into one big hit. Alaska smash. Izuku shouts as he puts his all into his right arm. It breaks but it seems to cave in the villain's face and sends him careening into the cliff wall, which begins to collapse along with the surrounding edge. Izuku then uses Float to fly down and catch Kauta in his unbroken arm. You okay Kauta? Izuku says with a shaky smile on his face. The little boy just looks up at him with surprise and a touch of awe. He then nods before both hear a rumbling from the rubble. Suddenly Muscular burst out of the rocks and happily shouts, Yes, that is what I'm talking about. Let's see if you can keep doing that. He then boosts his muscles to their maximum and rushes toward the boys, with the older of the two covering the younger to protect him, sure of the impact from hulking monster. Instead though, Muscular's fist is stopped by Jotaro's two hands. Izuku, get Kauta out of here. I'll take it from here. Jutero says while holding back Muscular's fist. Izuku nods before thanking the larger teen. Muscular looks over Jutero before saying, You're the guy that won the festival right. Well then, this is gonna be even more fun than before. Fun, do you just enjoy reveling in your power? Jutero asks with a cold angry tone. When the muscle-bound villain replies he does, he goes on to explain his perspective. We've got these powers and everything, but no one wants to use them. They all just want to hide away or not let out what is true to ourselves. But I want to have a big bloody brawl killing as many as I want to and showing that the might I have makes me right. Muscular shouts before throwing another punch at Jotaro. It catches the teen in the jaw and sends him backward. But the boy quickly rights himself before tackling and slamming the large villain into the cliff wall. I think I'll teach him a lesson before breaking him. Jotaro thinks to himself after punching the man a few times. Muscular then grabs the Jotaro's arm and throws him onto the ground. He then maxes out his muscles beyond what he's done before and throws blow after blow down upon Jotaro who just blocks for the most part, crossing his arms in front of him. Muscular loses himself in his bloodlust and enjoyment of pummeling someone he believes beneath him. But he slightly notices something odd. He's not bleeding. Why isn't he bleeding? He thinks before throwing another punch. But then his amplified fist is caught and held in place. Jotaro then moves the bulked-up arm to the side slowly, looking as though he's just annoyed by the attacks from Muscular. 
This infuriates the villain, and he throws another strong punch. But Jotaro catches his other fist easily. He then moves his hands to the side with a look of contempt on his face. Jotaro then tightens his grip on the man's hands before twisting slightly and pushing Muscular off of him. The tightened grip makes Muscular wince, as does the fact that Jotaro isn't even phased by his power. The boy then casually sits up, pushing the villain back as if it is nothing, then standing as if he had just tripped. All the while Muscular is infuriated by the actions and reactions of the teen in front on him, let alone the fact he can't pull his hands free from Jotaro's grip. There is suddenly a flash from Jotaro's eyes and he says to Muscular, I break everything you hold dear. And with a solid twist, he snaps both of Muscular's arms. Even though he had bulked them up with his full power, the villain starts screaming in pain, but it is only the beginning. Jotaro grabs the back of the man's head before pulling it down with all his might and smashing the man's face with his knee. While the villain is reeling from that, Jotaro gets above him and destroys both of the man's upper arms and shoulders with a blow. He then trips the man before grabbing his left leg and snapping all of the bones in it, before crushing the man's pelvis with a stomp. As well as other parts, Muscular can barely comprehend what is happening through all of the pain he is feeling. Even as Jotaro takes a pair of boulders and crushes the man's right leg, Jotaro then picks the man up and holds him above his head, and then brings the man down hard with his knee impacting the man's spine, breaking it. But Jotaro doesn't stop. He then stomps, and a pointed boulder is pulled up from the ground. He then slams the man's back onto the boulder, breaking it in a few more places. He then tosses Muscular into the air, grabs his head again and smashes it into the boulder a dozen times. By the time Jotaro is done with him, the mad villain Muscular is barely recognizable. Muscular can barely even feel anything anymore, and he looks at Jotaro with a bit of fear. Jotaro then grabs the man's head again before letting his gamma wave flow. But instead of fully healing Muscular, Jotaro has figured out how to target the quirk alone and eradicates Muscular's quirk while leaving him completely broken. Wasp, Wasp Guin Fun, I can't ff vessel my quirks. Muscular tries to say with a broken jaw and face. Jotaro just looks down at the man with contempt before saying, I destroyed your quirk. You'll never be able to fight again, you'll never be able to even walk again. I've destroyed everything you feel defines you and drives you, because that is the justice you truly deserve. Jotaro then punches the man in the face to make sure he won't remember that part. With the villain defeated, Jotaro starts to head back to check on the rest and to help the teachers. But as he is going a new figure appears. A large buff woman runs out of the bushes, and over her shoulder is Izuku. She spots Jotaro and takes off toward the gas and flames area. Jotaro is stunned but then focuses all his efforts on catching up with the two, while the rest have their own battles to fight. Jotaro POV. How the hell did this person manage to knock out Izuku? Not only that but how come I can't catch up with her? Wait where did she? Jotaro. What are you doing? I hear from Aizawa. He's engaging a group of other villains. All of these ones seem to be the type that use quirks though. One with a big magnet, one that there seems to be multiple of, and a Namu. Well now, the big dog of UA, the top fighter of the sports festival. I wonder what you think you could. Duck, the weird one with the magnet on Pixie Bob's head says. And then I decked. Him, her, I can't tell for a few reasons, least of which being everything still seems off to me. Don't know why, but that isn't important. I pick Pixie Bob up and toss her to Tiger. There's more trouble out there. I don't think these are the only ones. One of them has Izuku. I've got to get him back. I say before leaping off again. I can vaguely hear Aizawa telling me to stop and get back there but there is no time. Let alone the fact that whatever that gas cloud is has a few others trapped. I think. I can only seem to sense Itsuka's mind and energy for some reason. Never mind. I have to get Izuku back and stop whoever that beefy girl is. Okay wait that isn't right. Built. Solid. I'm not sure and. Wait a minute why am I getting distracted right now? I need to calm down. She and Izuku are out here and she's most likely going to take him away. I have to tune everything out. As I land I use an old meditation technique to quiet everything in my mind. I push out the noise first. All the sounds I can hear from Mustafa and all the way to Hong Kong. Next sense of smell. Tone out the gas smell nearby, as well as the general smell of the sea in dumps from cities and living near an ocean. Just a bit more. Focus on the energy sense. I got a general read on her earlier, so I should be able to track her despite my senses acting funny for some reason. There she is, running toward the, huh, there are a few others out there, and they don't have quirks, but they do have power. This is probably the League of Villains, and they've got real villains for allies this time, namely some especially powerful true metas. Well, that's not good. That just means more trouble in the long run. I think out loud before rushing toward where I think she and Izuku are. On the way I pass Safi and Ragdoll. To Taro, what's going on? Safi asks while I hurry past. I only tell her that someone grabbed Izuku. We've got other problems. The quirk villains aren't the real threat. I say while running further on. There she is. Hang on Izuku. I've got you pal. I can sense the woman who grabbed Izuku just below me. One shockwave punch should be enough to stop her. And then, oh crap. Right as I think that I get hit from behind by what seems to be Takoyami fighting a true meta villain. Said villain has grown to match what I'm guessing is Toko when he unleashes Dark Shadow at night. Both are huge and trading blows with one another. Wait a second. 
Izuku, the woman seems to have stopped for now, not sure why, may be caught up in the spectacle of the huge man and shadow monster fighting with each other. Never mind, I've got to woe. Now what, Shoto? And he's fighting some other lady with earth manipulating powers, which includes making the lava. Great, I think these two have it covered so I'll get Izuku in. Stay away, I can't control it. I hear Toko shout out. Shoto is in trouble as well. His ice can't match up with a true meta controlling earth and lava the same way. But that other woman is still getting away with Izuku. Damn it, I'm going to have to get kinda desperate again. So I focus in on the villain with Izuku and teleport right behind her. All I can do is stop her for now, but a good shoulder tackle should stop her. And it does just that. She's down for a bit and Izuku is at least knocked away for now. First things first. Lava girl. With one burst forward I slam the lady. I take the back she's a bit younger. Barely 18, I think. But I still can't hold back fully. I punch her in the stomach hard before uppercutting her in the chin. While she's up in the air, I grab her leg and slam her onto the ground knocking her out. Next is Toko. And I think it would be best to knock both of them out. But the villain can probably take more. So I leap up and give a strong right hook to the big villain's jaw. Then I kick off his face and double hammer fist down onto Toko's head to knock him in dark shadow out. Huh. The impact was a bit bigger than I anticipated but I've got a different problem to deal with. The big guy is shaking off the hit so I've gotta hit him harder. I blast toward his face and unleash blow after blow into the giant of a man. Before jetting around, grabbing him from behind and supersize suplexing him into the dirt. Okay now the impact is smaller. Right as I land, the girl who had grabbed Izuku is standing. And she's clapping. Bravo. Bravo indeed. I see why Tamira had such a problem dealing with you. You are quite a bit like All Might. But that is something of a weakness in itself. Huh. What is she? Who? Jitaro. Why did you? The Earth Manipulator starts to ask. Why is she asking me that? She was the one who attacked my friend. Oh, Toko's waking up. He should be okay. Hey haha. <laughs> Impressive. You make quite the impact, don't you? Um Toko. What are you talking about? You know I can do this, and... It is then that the Earth Manipulator interrupts with a couple of coughs. Before saying, Jotaro. What are you talking about? Cough. That's not Takoyami. Okay now I'm confused. What? What is Shoto talking about? What happened to Guk? Right as I'm thinking that, I get blasted in the side from a pillar of fire. Wait that hit felt solid. Why did I also feel heat from it? That's not how Shoto's fire side works. And it seemed akin to an ice wave. What is? You know your mind is quite impressive. I can't even begin to really break through. The best I could do was to meddle with your senses. But once I got that far, it wasn't hard to mess with your perception. The woman I was chasing says. But that's impossible. I've made sure to have blocks on my mind to where I can't be. And before I can finish my thought, the fuzz over my senses lifts. And I can perceive things properly again. Including the fact that I just broke one of my friend's arms and a few other parts. As well as hurting Toko because I didn't know it was him. No, 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 no. Not again. Not again. I start shouting before I get jumped by who I thought was Izuku. It's someone else, and I can feel my energy being drained away. Compress. Hurry. I'm draining him as fast as I can, but he could still break out of this. The one who grabbed me says. Suddenly a new figure jumps out and touches me. And things go even blacker than before. Well, that worked. Glad I had made a backup plan after the green head got away. We need to get the other kid and out of here. Grab the bird-headed kid too. He managed to take out Moonfish after all. The larger woman says while handing the marble that Jutero was sealed inside of to Ryan. Who then says, we still should get out of here, Selain. Even if I'm constantly draining him, I don't want to press my luck against this guy. Selai nods before telling Compress again to grab Takoyami and Todoroki. While a bit indignant of this upstart ordering her around, he still complies. Or he would if it wasn't for Todoroki managing to regain his breath enough to ice slide over and grab the bird-headed boy. He then slides as fast as he can to get away and get back up to save Jotaro. A few of the forgotten shout for him to get back there. While Rei, first telling Emma to be careful, is now running back toward the main villain camp with Selain. I've got to get away. If I or both of us get grabbed too, then the heroes won't know that Jotaro has been taken. Todoroki thinks to himself while sliding away. Takoyami is injured and still unconscious after Jotaro attacked him, and Shoto is nursing a broken arm. And unfortunately, the villains aren't backing down. Shoto is being chased by both Lima and Emma, with the former having sized up a bit to increase the length of his strides, and latter levitating a boulder beneath her and directing herself forward. Shoto almost makes it back to where the heroes are battling the quirked villains. They are having a bit more luck comparably due to Jotaro knocking out Mange earlier in the fight. But Emma manages to raise a rock wall and trips up Shoto enough. But just before the villains can grab him, he makes a wall of fire around himself and Takoyami. Rather foolish. This is almost too easy to snuff out. Emma says with a dismissive wave of her hand as some softened earth rises up and puts out the flames. Shoto is wincing a bit as his arm is still broken and he can't move around without leaving Takoyami behind. But then he smiles a bit. Wasn't trying to stop you. Just sending up a little signal. Suddenly Izuku and Safentite burst through the brush and blast the villains into the same clearing as the LOV group. Upon seeing the new group of villains, the heroes are confused. 
and when Emma notices that Aizawa had mange, while Tiger and Mandalay had defeated most of the Twice clones and the Namu, she rolls her eyes. Yes, you guys underestimated them, she says before slamming her fists into the ground. And then a wave of earth is created, and it knocks all those in its path into the air. She then points her hands towards the villains and catches them with a set of earth hands and tendrils. When the heroes shake off the effects, Lima steps forward and grows to about half his maximum height. He then slams his hand down to keep the heroes busy. Meanwhile Izuku has grabbed Shoto and Safentite had saved Takoyami. Midoriya, where have you been? Shoto asks while on Izuku's back. Izuku looks up at Shoto with a confused look. What do you mean? I've been back at Lodge. I took Kauta there after I got away from the muscle quirk villain. Jutero took him down. Speaking of have you seen him? Something happened. Cuff. I think one of those other villains managed to mess with him. He did this to the both of us. Takoyami says starting to wake up. Upon hearing that both Izuku and Safentite's eyes are wide. Especially when Shoto mentions that Jutero started freaking out after he noticed or realized what happened. We have to get him back. Safentite says with a panicked expression. Izuku agrees while they drop their two injured classmates back at the lodge. Once they do, they tell the rest that Jutero was in trouble. As they head back, the heroes are struggling with the new set of villains that arrived. Compress. Forget taking anyone. Just get out of here. You've got skill. But if you get caught, we could lose the main target. Or worse. Lima commands while swiping at Tiger and Mandalay. The stage magic villain is a bit indigent, but he also knows some of what this is about for them. They want to make their own statement. The League has made our own, though we failed. But, they're actually gaining ground against the heroes. I guess we can leave it to them. Compress thinks before using his quirk on the Namu. He then wakes up Mange and tells her they need to get going. While they are retreating, Aizawa is trying to cancel both Lima and Emma's powers. But it does nothing. This is bad. I don't think these two are quirked villains. Damn right you self-righteous ass. We've been pushed aside enough. Treated like we don't matter or that we're beneath everyone. But now, we are going to break down you damn pieces of shit who think you're heroes. Lima roars out before growing out of the playa buddy restraint that Tiger had tried to hold him with. And then backhanding the man so hard he crashes through a wall to the lodge. This shocks the students, as well as making them feel a bit of remorse. After a few of them had heard what Izuku and Kazuhiko had gone through, they could understand where this new set of villains was coming from. Kazuhiko even steps out of the classroom and looks on at the gigantic villain. Pixie Bob tries to help Aizawa but her earth flow is being outclassed by Emma's geokinesis. I thought we were using the same power. Pixie Bob shouts after creating another group of earth beasts. But then they fall to pieces and the dirt uses sent at her. Emma just smirks before saying, your power lets you control earth that you've touched right. Well, I don't have that restriction. Plus, it seems pretty clear that you can only manipulate dirt and rock. It doesn't seem like you can do anything else. Before the heroes can ask what she means, the woman directs her hands towards some of the earth, and then shifts it into lava. Upon seeing that, all of the hero teachers are wide-eyed. Even Izuku and Safentite are surprised. This is why we're true menace. We have power that surpasses quirks. You are just pretenders who only want to play with your silly little tricks. Lima roars again before clapping his huge hands together and knocking back the heroes. Izuku grits his teeth before stepping up to face off with this new threat. Safentite joins him, floating in front of the heroes before powering up some spells to fight back. You aren't wrong. We have been on the side where we've been pushed down. But that doesn't mean we have the right to kill and take whatever we want. If anything, we know better than anyone else what it means to be powerless. And what you are doing here. It will never make things right. It just continues the pain. Izuku shouts back at the two villains. Something he said does seem to strike a chord with the villains. But they refuse to change their path. With Emma shouting, you've probably had it a bit easier than we did. You weren't abandoned. You weren't pushed away by the rest of the world and your family. We were. And we're going to show them what the wanted did. All because of the twisted disease that is Quirks. She then directs her hands toward the group, while creating more lava to attack them. Izuku and Safentite both blast away with the wear smashes and magic. But it isn't enough to stop the wave of lava, until Kazuhiko arrives and uses an uncontrolled version of the blast he tested earlier in the day. While it does knock him back, it also knocks away the wave of lava directed at the heroes. I know what you mean, but I agree with Izuku, and I won't let you hurt the ones who have tried to help me, both with teaching me how to use my power and giving me and a few others abandoned by the world a chance for something more. Kazuhiko says on trembling knees. He then says to Izuku that he needs to get to Jotaro. The green teen is surprised, but glad that his Kuai in training under Jotaro is willing to stand. Even if he is terrified, Izuku nods before making a smokescreen with a punch toward the ground. He blitzes away, while Safentite uses her magic to grow and match Lima's size. And Kazuhiko faces down with Emma. He breathes deep before remembering what Jotaro mentioned about him having increased speed. Right as Emma is raising up a bunch of earth to attack him with, Kazuhiko is right in front of her, and gives her as strong of a punch as he can manage. This is enough to knock the girl down from boulder she had raised up but she still recovers by turning the ground beneath her into softer earth. She then tries to use more pillars of earth to capture or crush Kazuhiko, but he still manages to dodge effectively. Even one time when she traps him in mud, he uses his M transformation to turn intangible. 
before getting up close with a knee to her face. I'm impressed. How long have you had your powers? About a week. Kazuhiko responds. Upon hearing that, both Lima and M are shocked. Only one week with his powers and he can do this. It took a few of us almost a month before we could do much. That Jotaro kid can really train a person well. We definitely need him on our side. Emma thinks to herself. Lima meanwhile has been trading blows with the gigantified Saffentite. Neither is really making headway, but Lima manages to sucker punch her by rapidly shifting his size. At one point he shrinks down to dodge a blow from the girl before quickly growing back to half his maximum and punches the girl in the side of the knee. This makes Saffentite crumple a bit, but she recovers and decides to focus on fighting by her terms. I tried too hard to knock you out at your level. I'm a genie after all. That means I've gotta be tricky, Saffentite says before making a big bar of soap that Lima slips on. When he tries to attack the girl again, she splits in half before blasting the man in the face with some magic. Meanwhile, Izuku is running around the forest trying to find the villain that Shoto had said was holding Jutero. Hang in there, John. I'll save you, Izuku says out loud. Before he can focus on that though, he notices Achako and Suyu fighting a strange girl who is attacking them with knives. He quickly fires off a Delaware smash and then a Las Vegas smash at the blonde slasher. The first smash knocks the knife out of the girl's hand, while the second catches the girl in the stomach. Sorry I can't help you more Uraraka, but someone's grabbed Jotaro, Izuku says before leaping off. Upon hearing that the strongest member of their class had been captured, both girls are shocked. Ha ha ha, I guess the forgotten managed to pull it off. I wonder if they'll be able to grab Izuku-kun as well, the girl known to them as Himiko Toga said with a twisted smile on her face. Achako looks back at her attacker and questions her on who the forgotten were. The villainous blonde smile widened before saying, they are the people our whole society has pushed down. The ones most everyone believes to be useless or worthless. Former quirkless who gained power beyond what most quirks can do. And now they'll be breaking as many heroes as possible. Upon hearing that, both heroines' eyes widen again but this time in a bit of regret. This was some of what Kaminari and the rest joked about, that there would be plenty of true metas who would want payback on the rest of the world. Suyu says with a tilt of her head. Achako thinks much the same, and wonders if there was a chance that Izuku or Jotaro could have become just like them. While they are distracted though, Toga gets back up and manages to make a small cut on each of them, getting just a little drop of blood. She then cuts and runs away deeper into the forest. Back with Izuku, he is still running through the woods trying to find Rei. He finally spots the young man but is distracted by a strange buzzing in the back of his head. All of a sudden a blast of blue fire is streaming towards him. He dodges in time before firing off a Texas smash with his left arm in the direction of the blast. Well now, I guess I shouldn't be surprised you are here. The guy we grabbed is supposed to be your mentor after all. An oily voice says from the tree line. The one who steps out is the villain of blue flames, Dabai. I wonder if we could break that hero more if we managed to injure you. Dabai says while building up more flames in his hand. He is contacted though by Sasaku. Just keep him busy. We need that other hero student. He's the best of the school, and if we show how pathetic the heroes were at keeping him safe, well we can set up quite a few lines of rhetoric. Wanting to be rid of a quirkless person, doing away with a power they can't understand, being so ineffective because their quirks are pathetic in comparison. But it won't matter if we don't get him back here. The patchwork villain rolls his eyes but does like where the girl is going with ideas. So, he complies with the plan. Izuku keeps dodging the flames, as well as the sneak attacks from the hidden twice clones. Man he just keeps dodging so well. He's just really clumsy. One of the copies says. Izuku looks around before taking stock of what his options were. He took a deep breath before making a multitude of black whips and wrapping up all the copies in Dabai. He then spun around and around, calling out, Wichitar line smash, slamming the villains through the trees nearby before tossing them away. Well, that's one annoyance away. Now to catch that other guy. Izuku says before full cowling again to search for Rei. When he finds the man again, he readies up a Delaware smash again. But he is surprised this time by Rei himself. He turns back to Izuku and holds up his hand. Suddenly, Izuku feels a drain on his energy and even some of the kinetic enhancement he had built up. He then falls and rolls over before crashing through a tree. Nothing personal, kid. But I can't let you stop me, Rei says. And right as Rei is saying that, Kurajiri appears behind the young man. Izuku gets up on an elbow with a grunt. He looks and sees the blue-haired man going into Kurajiri's gate. No, Jutero. John, give him back. Izuku shouts while struggling to stand up. He trips though as he is trying to run to take back his captive friend. But it is too late. Rei, Kurajiri, and Jutero are gone. Back with the villains, Kazuhiko has managed to actually hurt Emma. And Saffentite has been pushing Lima's size shifting abilities, while also comedically fighting him. But suddenly Kurajiri appears behind them. We've got what we needed. Time to go. The Shadow Man says before widening his portal. The two true meta villains nod before creating a smokescreen of the dirt and stone in the area. Saffentite though is worried. Wait does that mean? John, no. The genie girl says with a small voice and a hand covering her mouth. Kazuhiko is also surprised and worried for his teacher. While the teachers and pros feel the weight of their failure. That they couldn't protect their students when it counted most. No POV. Well, this might be a problem. 
Nezu says after getting the report from the training camp, while most of the students were fine, there were still a few who were injured or exposed to toxic gases, let alone the fact that the pros who were supposed to be protecting them defeated by the new set of villains that appeared. I always suspected that there would be many quirkless who were disgruntled or angry at the current world, and it is some of my fault that they feel that way. All Might says with a sigh, Nezu wants to counter the number one hero's statement, but he knows the man is correct. You are not the only one at fault Tashinori. The fact is many of us who are called heroes are much the same. Even before you became the number one, most heroes were competing or looking to be the best or use their quirks however they wanted. That made those with either weaker, useless quirks or without them envious. If any of them got a taste of power, they would jump at the chance to use it. The person saying this was none other than All Might's old teacher, Gran Torino. He was leaning on a cane in his hero costume while sitting in the principal's office at UA. Nezu meanwhile mentions that they will have to make a press statement about their failure to protect the students, let alone the fact that Jotaro was the only one captured. The media will have a true field day with that part. I've already been getting calls from quirkless support groups, Nezu said before his phone started ringing again. All Might could surmise the reason for that. They feel that we may have or must have let them take Jotaro since he was technically a quirkless individual, and thus someone most with quirks would see as beneath their view. It's not that surprising. Too many see the idea of these true metas as a threat to not only the peace you've built but to the whole identity that has been built around quirks, let alone many like the leaders of the Hearts and Minds Party and Detrenet trying to claim that the destroyed minds element from quirks was circumstantial at best. Despite the evidence to the contrary, Torino mentioned before thinking back on a special individual he had met not long ago. Torino had not arrived alone to UA. While Jotaro had only mentioned it as a joke, Torino did go out and look for those who might have the potential to be true metas. He happened upon one living in an old shrine outside of his agency's city. The man was one who had been living on the bare minimum as it were. He had been living with family, but most of them were killed due to villain attacks or those looking to remove what they saw as a step backwards. When Torino found him he was fighting back against a few from Deka City, with the power to shapeshift and mold his body into any form or item. Torino stepped in and took down the offenders before offering the man a place at his home, and a chance to learn more about what he could do. He was going by Nobasu to match with capabilities and was working with Power Loader to make himself a suit that would shapeshift with him. While he was doing that, the oldest heroes at UA were discussing matters going forward. Not only must we recover Jotaro, but we need to stop the League of Villains and find out who is aiding them, Nezu says before excusing himself. At the hospital, the pros who had been injured or disabled during the battle with the Forgotten were discussing matters as well. Not only should we have seen this coming, but we should have tried to find a way to counter it. Aizawa says while nursing a broken arm, Tiger sighs before saying, I think most heroes are too caught up in thinking that quirkless people couldn't pose a threat to them. Now look where that has left us. The male member of the group was nursing a broken leg, arm, and injured back from being tossed through walls by Lima, while Pixie Bob had some burns from the lava attacks sent her way by Emma of the Forgotten. Mandalay and Ragdoll were the least injured of their team, the latter only having some scrapes and bruises from the chainsaw Namu that attacked her before Saffentite stepped in to save her. That big guy made a very good point. We all underestimated them. All because we thought we could do much more with our quirks, Mandalay said while scratching at the bandages on her head. Cam meanwhile feels guilty for not aiding his comrades during the fight, as he had stayed back to keep an eye on the other remedial students in the lodge, only missing that Kazuhiko had gone after Izuku had arrived back. We are probably going to have a major storm brewing thanks to the fact that Jotaro-kun was taken. I know that one of the students took a video of that huge guy's speech, and it's been uploaded to the net, so that means we could be looking at backlash because we didn't save a former quirkless person. And we got beat by former Quirkless as well, Kan says as Nezu was arriving to speak with those gathered. He does confirm what Kan suspected and tells Aizawa they would need to make a press statement soon. Aizawa just has a flat annoyed look on his face before asking if the principal was serious. Upon seeing the gleam in the rodent-like administrator's eyes, Aizawa knows he isn't getting out of this. For the students, most had gathered in Momo's room to discuss matters. So you and Oase managed to plant a tracker on one of the Nomis. Hiroshima questioned when they had finally been allowed to visit the girl. She nods before explaining that she had given the tracker receiver to the police. But it wouldn't be difficult for you to make another right. Izuku says with a serious look. Momo looks to the class rep of one and pieces together what he has in mind. Ida though is not pleased with what Izuku has in mind. You can't be serious Midoriya. We need to leave this to the pros. They'll get Jotaro back, you know that. You can't do this on your own. He's not going to be alone. Because I'm coming too. Safentite says with her own stern look. Kazuhiko then steps up to say he'll be helping as well noting that he owes Jotaro for helping him learn how to use some of his abilities. But wouldn't that make you guys just like the villains? After all you'd be breaking the laws too. Suyu says to try and dissuade her classmates. It wouldn't be breaking the laws for a few reasons. The main one being that those laws only apply to those with quirks. And we don't have quirks. Izuku says with finality. Todoroki chuckles a bit before saying, You really are a lot like Jotaro. He said almost the exact same thing back during the Eye Island incident. And you both are right. This time though, I think it would be best if we left it up to you. 
Izuku nods before asking Momo to make another receiver to try and find Jotaro. Momo just sighs before saying he was crazy. But here you go. Just promise that you will try to be careful. No absolutes, but we will try to stay safe. Thanks, Yayarazu. Izuku says with a smile. Safentite then comes over and hugs the onyx-haired girl before thanking her as well. With that, the three quirkless heroes go to try and track down the missing Jotaro Esfoboda. But not before one more asks to come along. I know I don't have the same leniency that you all do. But, I don't want to abandon Jotaro. I, I wouldn't be able to live with it if I just didn't try to find him as well. Kendo Itsuka says with her fists clenched tight. She then asks to join the group with a bow. Izuku isn't too sure himself, while Kazuhiko doesn't know the girl well enough to make a call. Safentite though steps up and places her hand on the martial artist's shoulder. Are you absolutely sure you want to do this? Safentite asks firmly while looking Itsuka in the eye. The girl doesn't waver as she simply says, yes. Safentite then smiles before saying okay. While Izuku doesn't know what to make of the matter, he just shrugs and tells the base plan of going to Kamino Ward. We may have to hide a bit before we can move on where this thing is pointing us to. Relax Izuku, I have that covered, Safentite says with an air of confidence. For the rest of the heroes, they are planning to raid what they believe to be the main hideout of League of Villains. So this bar is that we believe the League is stationed at. Endeavor asks in a contemplative tone, one that surprises Best Genist. I would have thought you would be complaining about being involved in this attack. Endeavor scoffs before mentioning that he owed the one who was taken. Edshot chuckles before commenting, strange to think that getting beat by a teenager would calm you down. The number two shoots the fold body hero a glare before the meeting moves along, with Detective Tsukachi Nayamasa noting that they believe there were two hideouts. The bar is one and we'll be having a second team going after the other, which we have the general location for thanks to the efforts of two students. But we do have a different problem. Most likely they have the aid of some very powerful true metas, calling themselves the Forgotten, uncomfortably apt. But we have a little true meta power to aid us as well. Mabasu-san. The rest of the group turn to look over the blue-haired man. He was wearing a tight blue leotard suit around his body, with tai chi shoes on his feet. I'll do what I can. I'm still trying to figure a few things out, but luckily I actually have a suit to wear rather than just making my own clothes. It was a little awkward at times, Nobasu says with a smile. When Endeavor questions what he was talking about, the blue-haired man's smile grows. He then looks the fiery hero over, and then quickly shapeshifts into a perfect copy of him. This shocks everyone, and then Nobasu does the same for a few others, including becoming a perfect physical duplicate of All Might. Shapeshifting into people is interesting but Edshot starts, but then Nobasu does some new transformations, including turning into items, as well as turning his fists into hammers, and super stretching his arms and legs like whips. After being shocked by the actions, Nobasu jokingly says, I can transform my body almost any way I like, even making clothes to copy those I'm looking at. But I personally prefer this to just making a suit or pants or whatever from my body. Best Genus gets a bit of a laugh at all of this before noting that it would be exceptional in the battle to come. And Tsukachi notes that the UA group is hopefully giving them enough time to attack. I agree. This is one of my students that has been taken after all. I'm not letting them get away with this. All Might says with a fierce look in his blue eyes. Internally though he is thinking more about getting Jotaro out of trouble. Hold on John. I won't let them keep you. With the villains though, they are having their own set of struggles. We lost three members from the League, the Forgotten made their statement and intentions known, and we only managed to capture one of the targets we were hoping to grab. Not what I would call a 100% clear. Tamira said with an annoyed tone at the bar that was the headquarters for the League. Natalie though shrugs before mentioning, it's not like the ones you lost were that special right. I mean yeah, Muscular was a bit of a loss. But really, I'd think he was something of a liability. The other two really were not that special in terms of both motive or power really. While Magni takes some offense to that, Tamira agrees with the leader of the Forgotten. You're not wrong really. Moonfish was just a crazed killer, and Muscular was the same. Mustard meanwhile just wanted to mock the whole fact that those kids we attacked were supposed to special since they were accepted into UA. Doesn't change that we still lost out quite a bit young Tamira. Hirajiri was quick to point out. Sasaku then asks their newest member, who was calling herself Psyche Link, what the status of getting control of Jotaro was. About that. I don't know why or how, but I can't even get into his head anymore. It's not just like the mental barriers before, more like he's shut off his mind, Psyche says with a shrug. Lewis mentions that Jotaro seemed to be freaking out after he realized what he did. So, maybe it's an overreaction to knowing he hurt his classmates. That does seem likely sister. For now I've been draining him of a bit more energy. But there is a problem. I can't really drain him enough to really depower him in any way. I don't know how, but he seems to have a wide variety of energy types running through his body. Ray and Emma discuss while nursing drinks. Yes, it seems he is quite the interesting individual as far as his capabilities go. And just like I believed, I cannot take his power. I've already tried and nothing happens. To the contrary, I seem to be rebuffed or burned the second I try. The benefactor of the League of Villains says from his screen. Tamira nods before mentioning that he'd like to reduce to tarot to ash. Save it for later man. Though I gotta be honest, I doubt you'll be able to. You have to touch things right. 
Will the guy have some kind of energy barrier around his body, or something of the like? Ray mentions offhand before asking to change the channel on the TV. Hirajiri acquiesces, though he asks why. Natalie then smiles before saying, We've got a little something special in mind right now. Something to drive home how useless most of the heroes are. On the screen, Aizawa, Kan, and Nezu are making a public apology about their failure to protect the students at the training camp. Are you sure you didn't let the winner of the sports festival be taken? One journalist asks before standing. Aizawa takes offense to this in defense that they did all they could at the time. Really? So you who are supposed to be some of the best trained heroes from UA couldn't stop a student who had a power you didn't understand from being taken? With that said a few other journalists ask the same, mentioning if the heroes were looking down or quirkless by not believing that they could have greater power, or mentioning the video that was posted with Lewis's speech on it, as well as some mentioning their sources telling that they and the wild wild pussycats were defeated easily, and they needed to be saved by their true meta students. Tamira smiles a bit before laughing. This is good. You have an ally there, right? And they are doing everything to paint the world of justice that the quirked heroes have tried to promote as pathetic, as well as making them acknowledge their underlying discrimination even if they don't state it outright. Ray says with a smirk. Emma then mentions that their ally isn't even a true metal like them, just a journalist who had their own hopes crushed by this egotistical society. So, they were forced to take other paths, and now they can use what we pass to them to make the heroes look bad. Dabai nods before asking if he could have their contact info too. While the hero teachers are struggling slightly to counter the claims of their negligence, Nezu is ready and brings up his own counter. It is true that our teachers were not ready for the attack from the true metas, and much of that is due to our lacking knowledge of true metas as a whole. But we have been in talks with some from my island and overseas to work on counters for some of these types of enemies, with the aid of those true metas who volunteer to aid us in the first place. Nezu then goes on to say he does not blame the true metas, or any quirkless for not trusting heroes or most of the public, stating that they have done little to prove their will to protect them as a whole. But now I see how terribly arrogant that mentality was. We all are guilty of that hubris. Every person with a quirk has that guilt because we have been so caught up in enjoying the powers. We have that we have forgotten portions of our humanity and used it as an excuse to demean others. Therefore, we are setting forth an initiative to study quirks much closer, and to possibly find a cure for the changes that have been brought about because of that. In other words, we are looking to remove quirks as a whole. When Nezu finishes his statement, many around the world are shocked. Those in the league and the members of the Forgotten included. Lewis is the first to say, okay, didn't see that coming. Many in the bar nod before asking if the guy was joking. I don't think so. He is totally serious. Huh. He actually wants to support research on removing or undoing this world of heroes. Dabai says with a little laugh. Toga and twice hum a bit as they think about what might happen if they could get their own quirks removed. Maybe. Maybe I would actually be normal. Not just the kind that mom and dad wanted me to be. Maybe. I wouldn't want to make others bleed if I didn't have my quirk. Toga thinks, while twice argues with himself about the idea of what being without his quirk could mean. While that is happening, Izuku's group follow the tracker and come upon a warehouse. They are each glamour charmed so they would not be noticed. Izuku now having blonde hair and brown eyes. Itsuka appears to have long silky black hair and green eyes with a dark tan, while Safantite has white hair and blue eyes and a pale skin tone. The only one minorly glamoured with Kazuhiko. Instead of the boy's regular brown hair and eyes, he now had red hair and green eyes and seemed to be a bit taller. Are you sure this is going to hold Safi? Itsuka asks while walking through the streets. Safantite shrugs before mentioning, Everyone is so caught up in the broadcast they probably wouldn't notice us even if it did dissipate. Izuku then mentions that they need to be careful, as this could be enemy territory. Hold up Izuku, I'll take a look around quick. Kazuhiko says before going am and disappearing. He bolts around a few times before returning with some unsettling news. I don't think this is where the villains are hiding out. I think this is where they make those monster things. Izuku's eyes widen before he says, Namu under his breath. Safantite asks if Kazuhiko saw anything else. The most I saw was a bunch of tanks filled with those monsters. Though, I couldn't see it exactly, but I could feel something odd. Like another thing putting out in waves. Itsuka then asks if there was some kind of radio or something in there. Safantite stops the questioning by saying they needed to find Jotaro. Izuku thinks a bit more before wondering if he was here for some special reason. With Jotaro himself though, there was a different issue. He was currently in a state sealed inside of his own mind. I did it again. I hurt someone because I couldn't control my power, or my abilities. And this time it was two people I saw as friends. I just, how long before I, how you would lose control? You've already been there and back, and I'm pretty sure you know that. Within Jotaro's mind, here's one of his other selves. This one a bit calmer and more confident, and sounding strangely like Toshinori and him mixed together. How many times are we going to go through this? You freak out every time you lose control or if your power rampages in some way. The other voice says. Jotaro just comes back with, what do you expect? The first time I lost control, you destroyed so much and caused insane amounts of chaos. Trust me, I know, I was there too. The other side gives Jotaro a smirk and eyebrow raise to tell he's not too worried. 
Jutero though just has a consistent flat look instead of the panicked face he'd had for a few hours. So the other side decides to point out that even with all of his possible loss of control, he still tries to save lives. We both know you could take most people out with one hit, or you could just stomp all over and bring about insane destruction. But you don't. You've heard it more than once, but you are not a monster. You are nothing like what the maniac who has us now has made. Or even like said maniac. You care more about lives than you want to admit, and you will continue to be what you've always been. A hero at your core, with powers or without. Though the other self-statements are compelling, it isn't quite enough to bring Jotaro fully out of his mind. Though it is enough to ease his conscience for now. At the bar, as the UA group are finishing the press conference, the forgotten feel unease from a few of their allies. Natalie snorts before saying, I wouldn't be too worried about those plans of theirs. This quest of theirs has some major obstacles, least of all being the average fools who want to cling to their powers no matter what. Like that so-called Liberation Army. I agree. There's plenty who think that the possibility that monster from UA revealed is just an outlier. Tamura says before scratching his neck a bit. I suddenly hear a knock at the door. Camino Pizza Delivery is heard by all in the location. Lewis is the first to speak with, who ordered pizza. When the rest look to each other in confusion, they think it is just a wrong address. Suddenly, the wall burst in thanks to an attack from All Might. Before Kirajiri can create portals to get them away, Kamui Woods wraps them all up in the lacquered chain prison, with Gran Torino knocking out Dabai to make sure he can't use his fire. All the while, Nobasu had quickly slipped in and transformed himself into part of Heinko's costume. Just in case, the police quickly swarm in with Edshot, while Endeavor watches over the outside to make sure no villains can get away. Where is Jutero? All Might demands once the heroes are sure they have the villains caught. But Lewis snaps out of his confusion and starts to expand to break out of Kamui's signature move. So All Might tries to knock the man out as well, but Lewis dodges the initial hit. Don't think we are done All Might. We will tear down this messed up world you've made. Tamira shouts first, with Natalie saying, You may say you are the symbol of peace, but do you really embody that? We've all been abandoned or had our peace broken because of the how you really represent nothing more than ego and power that is wrapped up in quirks. You and every other hero like you. This stuns a few of the heroes gathered, while the police are about to start fully restraining the villains. But Natalie's outburst gave her enough time to use her own power and tip the scales to their allies. First with part of the bar floor caving in and dropping the police and Ed shot to a lower floor. Then Liu as avoids enough hits to break out and swat All Might out of the building. Kurajiri now. Natalie shouts as the portal man creates an opening to the other hideout while also leaving some presents for the heroes. Back at the warehouse, Kazuhiko lets in the rest to the building, and they check around to find Jutero. They eventually find him in one of the back rooms, but he isn't moving. What's wrong with him? Itsuka asks as she throws his arm over her shoulder. Safentite says, I'm betting it has to do with what happened to Todoroki and Takoyami. He's actually really afraid of his power and hurting them must have really scared him. Then we need to Izuku started but then the wall of the warehouse busted open thanks to a pickup breaking through. The warehouse was quickly swarming with police and heroes. While the students were a bit worried about being caught, Izuku felt an unsettling shiver go down his spine. He's here. Izuku heard within his mind. He turned to the side and saw a shadowy man with a black metal mask covering his entire head. And within his mind he knows that this man is all for one. Before the man can act or respond, Best Genus quickly restrains him with his quirk. Safi, get ready. Izuku says quietly to the genie girl. He then quickly signals to Itsuka to take Jotaro away as best she can. Tamura has just started to take actions on his own. Not only that but he has gained allies that can truly aid him in what he is looking to do. I can't let you get in his way anymore. The shadowy AFO says before breaking free of Genus's restraints and trying to unleash an air blast at the heroes. But the students surprise him, with Kazuhiko quickly getting under the man's arm and points the attack away from the heroes. While Safentite and Izuku quickly rush out and pull everyone they can out of the warehouse. What are you doing here? Genus shouts first while being pulled back by Safentite. She quickly responds with a no time quip and pulls the group as far as she can for the time being. AFO claps before complimenting Izuku and the rest. You are quite exceptional. You more than likely were terrified, yet you still acted to save the others. Both this boy you picked up at the training camp and you two who got the rest out in before I could finish my attack. When it looked like Genist was about to try and use his clothes to restrain AFO again, Safentite stopped him. That won't work. You can't match up to this guy. He's got too much power for most anyone with a quirk. She turns back to keep her eyes on her enemy and hope they'll be able to get Jotaro away as well as make it out with all of the others' lives intact. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through what if Deku mastered OFA and his own quirk I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout-out to Han Baron for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works, the link is in the description below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to Deku Fanfic for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.